reach out Yeah, your skin can bring you so much pain Now I hear you say You got the best of both ways I want you to come and take a walk in my shoes And tell me if you take my place Welcome to episode number 146 of the Inside Running Podcast. Thank you for joining us for another week. Going to be a big show this one. We're going to be celebrating some Australian records. Uh, going to be talking about some world records, thanking some patrons. Um, we'll be doing some running news, doing all the kind of things we usually do on this podcast. Welcome to my co-host up in Canberra, Bradley Croker. How are you going this week? I'm good, thanks, Brady. It's been an exciting week in world athletics. It has, it has. Um, I'll talk about this a bit more in a second before I'll get to that. Though. I'll welcome, welcome my other co-host, Dan Anglesey, Julian Spence. How are you going? I'm, I'm good, but I'm missing the pump-ups that you used to give us when you used to introduce us. Yeah, sorry, boys. I worked today and I didn't have any preparation time, so I'm a bit under the pump. And, and just Off cut... the top of your head, you know our Actually, people. I was, Moose, going to say, introduce you as the guy that made the same World Championships team as Jessica Hull, the Australian record holder. Welcome to the podcast. That's true. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll take that one. That's, sure. your, that's your new claim to fame. First World Champs team each. Yeah, and now look at you both. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> uh, how good? Yeah, Jess, very nice girl. Great, um, great runner, by the way. Great run. We'll talk about her. It could be the. This is the only time we've spoken about an Australian running record on this podcast. No, one hundred and forty-six. Lynn and Hall broke the uh, mile mm. record, I think. Oh yeah, um, good knowledge. Yeah, Sarah Jamison's. Yep. Uh, yeah. Didn't, Joseph, didn't um, Joseph Deng also get the eight hundred? Yes. Correct. Katrina Bissett, women's Katrina 800. Bissett. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I've missed a, missed a few of them. Uh, Brett Robinson. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, Moose is on fire tonight. Moose, Moose, you're normally really shit with stats, but you're all over it. Oh, no, I'm the king. You got it covered. Yeah, yeah. Apologies to all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it was exciting. This will be the first world record. Oh, no, Kipchoge. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll stop talking now. <laughs> Brad, I haven't got any stats to introduce you. Do you want anything said about you before we get rolling on tonight's show? Oh, used to run okay. The 217 man. The 217 cool. man from Canberra. Washed up. Washed yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> we, what will it be tonight, Moose? Is he back on or is he back off tonight? Oh, I haven't looked at his Strava, but I'm calling off. <laughs> I, I, I'm not getting a lot of confidence from him. Well, let's see. Thanks to Sticks Brewery for supplying the beers this week as well. I'm having a beer. I'm not sure if you boys are having a beer to celebrate these world records and Australian records and the fact yep. that I got through Monday. I'm on the uh, ferryman tonight. On the ferryman, the old purple can. Bradley, tell us about your week. What happened? You back on? Uh, sort of. Um, so Monday, I so I didn't run on the Sunday. Um, ran mid morning on the Monday. It was friggin' super windy here. Um, first five k was into this straight headwind. Uh, wasn't a super enjoyable run. Did an hour or just over an hour, fourteen and a half k at four sixteens. Just ran from home down to Yerriby Pond, did a loop and back, uh, listened to the uh, Adrian Potter um, interview that you did a few weeks back. That was uh, a good listen. Um, so that was Monday. Uh, Tuesday, uh, yeah, family life got in the way. I had a pretty rough day with the kids, so I didn't end up running on Tuesday. Worked Wednesday, and I wasn't confident that I was going to run after work. And... Um, the period five for the first five weeks of term, the uh, year 10 girls have been doing uh, some sort of running as part of their, like they got to do some assignment looking at cardiovascular fitness and that sort of thing. So uh, we're at week four and um, I thought, oh, because for the first three weeks, I'd just been supervising and just watching the girls run. So I'm like, oh, maybe I'll take my running gear with me and, and I'll run, you know, they do 20 minutes. So I'm like, oh, maybe I'll, I'll run 20 minutes. That'll be my run for the day. And, Right up until the last period, I was unknowing whether I was going to do it or not. But um, yeah, went for a run. So just they just did laps at the school basically. So 20 minutes, 350s. Um, yeah, I wouldn't. I would say it wasn't a session, but it was sort of a progression run. I figured I'm only out there for 20 minutes, so I may as well make it worth my while. So that was my run on uh, Wednesday. Hang on. So their project is they just run laps at the school. Well, and then write first, a report on or something. Yes, if so, because I'm like just a relief teacher. I don't know what the actual assignment is. I just know for the first five weeks on period five on Wednesday they have to do 20 minutes of running. So the first week it was just a continuous run, 
um, around sort of a 1K loop that the teachers had set up. The second week, they did some interval training. And then the third week, they did laps around the school. And last week was the fourth week. So, um, yeah, they just ran for 20 minutes. So, uh, yeah, thought I'd jump in. So that was, yeah. Did you get the um, two-inch splitties in a racing yeah. singlet on? Uh, I didn't have the race singlet on, but I was in uh, I was in proper running kit. Yeah, mm, so okay. not not flats, just the just the Vimeros. But, uh, yeah, so... Um, so you stand them all up there at the start line and you start <laughs> dropping, like, running stats and stuff. Like, imagine his hair coming out the back of his hat and stuff, Moose. Hoodie He's on. run 350s. He's yeah. killing his girls. He ran the last K in 338. Oh. This would be like a, this is a solid flex here. The loop's like, I don't know, six, 700 metres, and I'd say the fastest... Most of them actually just walk it. It's, a, it's an absolute joke. Yeah. Um, but because I'm a relief teacher, I'm not there cracking the whip. I don't care sort of what they do. But uh, it's, yeah, like I reckon the quickest girl would have probably averaged uh, six-minute Ks maybe. Yeah, some, um, of, them, yeah, some of them have uploaded the Strava. Yeah, this girl, yeah, my, this girl ran 608. Yeah, so most of them, yeah, so I basically I jogged for the first few hundred metres and then I'm just like, oh, I'll just, just, I'll just do my 20-minute run. Um, yeah. Surely so anyway. you have some duty of care to actually supervise them, though, not just like fade yeah, well, twenty am. minutes. I am because I'm pretty much running. Like, I was running with the, um, the asthma puffer actually, in case anyone needed it. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, like I saw, the, I saw the girls heaps, heaps more actually than I would have the first few weeks where I was just stationed at one spot um, because yeah. I would have, I think, it lapped. I would have lapped the fastest girl two or three times. So, congrats! So anyway, Kudos. Thank you, thank you. I needed a, I needed a confidence booster. It's been a while since I've done anything good. Can you give him a little bit of spray as he come past. <laughs> one of them's <laughs> one of them's <laughs> put a Strava <laughs> title keep, on. Keep, keep left, keep left, girls. <laughs> track, track, track. One <laughs> of them's titled their run "Keep Running, Girls" in like quotations, and it says "teacher's voice" afterwards. Oh yeah, so that was the teacher in charge. So she ran it as well. So oh. what are you? <laughs> He wasn't even, he wasn't even working that day, Moose. just like an assistant assistant teacher or something? No, I'm, I'm a just relief the teacher, fence. but I'm just a regular on a Wednesday. Yeah. So what about, what's this other teacher there? She's, the a, full, that, she's a full-time PE teacher. She's the one who's taking him. So there's, there's three teachers out there. So two of us ran and another was just stationed on the oval. Ah. So it's like a 600-meter loop. It's not, yeah. It's not Sounds a lot like of... a lot of taxpayer money just for twenty minutes of running. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's uh, that was my run on Wednesday. Um, then on Thursday and Friday, uh, both of those runs were just ten miles out at uh, out at Mulligans. Four oh seven is the first day. Four oh eight is the second. Question: uh, Did yep. you actually run sixteen point oh nine to get ten miles exactly? Uh, I do make it. Uh, it's like sixteen point one. Yeah. Um, but then the second day, I ran 16.18k, which I just ran to back to the car. So, mm. but I just labelled them both 10 mile, close enough. But no, I didn't make a, I didn't make a conscious effort to stop on 0.09. I normally just go to 0.1. So, um, so <laughs> you never yeah. stop at 16 dead though. Yeah, the hundred. Uh, nah, made it, made it 16.1. Why not? Uh, so then Saturday. Uh, 45 minutes. Um, we had a bit of rain. Didn't run in the rain, but we had a fair bit of rain on the Friday. Um, felt actually this is the, probably the best run for the week for me. Uh, 45 minutes, uh, 403s out at Mulligans, and um, yeah, like had a few tunes playing, which helped. But yeah, definitely the best I felt like I was moving all week. And then a long run yesterday, uh, hour 45. Um, so I ran from home out to Mulligans and back. Uh, it was nice on the way out. On the way back, it was a uh, pretty strong headwind. So that was 25K, or just over 25K, 408s in an hour 45. So 80, 88K for the week, um, which most of that was sort of back-ended. I, I didn't do much up until Thursday, really. So, uh, yeah, just jogging around. I actually enjoyed the week because there's just, there just no pressure to go and do sessions, just run based on how I sort of felt. Um yeah, so that's where I'm at. You got a heart, you got a heart rate on? No, nah, no. Nah. Mm-hmm. Oh, like yesterday was tough. Yesterday's long run, and like part of it is how I'm moving, but also I've done probably three three long runs in twelve weeks, and 
like if you don't do long runs you you notice it like you get to an i got to an hour and a half and i was just like oh i'm, I'm dead here so um yeah long runs are the key and i reckon it'll take probably uh, i reckon when you miss that many long runs it probably takes about six to start feeling good again mm, yeah long runs are the things that you notice early well it makes everything feel easier it makes it makes the back end of sessions makes your easy runs feel even easier and you just you just, well, you just feel stronger mm-hmm. so um but i've yeah, like I've got a theory on what's been what's going on, um, so I'm working on some stuff to see if that improves it. But it's pretty much just my hip, my uh, my hip stability is just completely completely gone, and that's that's what's causing a lot of in terms of how I say I'm not covering the ground well. I don't feel like I've got any power. It's just purely to do with my pelvis control. So um, I'm still trying to do trying to do some stuff around that. I love the new theory every week. Yeah, we've heard about the hip before, though, haven't we? This isn't new. <laughs> no, but hip, yeah, no, like I've had like hip and back pain, but it's just the more I think about it, the more it's like I just have no, like when my foot hits the ground, I just, I'm real sloppy and have no control whatsoever. And you, you start thinking it's more your lower limb, but it's actually like your hip and pelvis control. And for most of my running life, I've just taken it for granted that you go for a run and it all feels normal. But as soon as you lose that uh, ability to control your pelvis, like you're a completely different runner. And um, I reckon like the, I reckon over 50% of the running population probably battle with, with pelvis stability. Um, and it probably makes running a lot harder for them. And um, yeah, like it's a relatively new thing for me because you know what, I've been running for 20 odd years and, yeah, you know, if I come back from an injury, I just start running, and yeah, I'm a bit unfit, but I still feel like I'm moving okay. So it's uh, something that's I don't know why it's happened, um, but it's something that I obviously need to uh, need to work on. So you've identified the new theory. What's going to be your action now to to work on it? What do you what do you need treatment, or you're doing drills, or what's yeah? What's, it's more ex- doing? it's more ex- I think it's more exercises um, like. Uh, like glute exercises, uh, that sort of thing, but also making sure that um, – because I was reading some article during the week where – so you know how muscles – like so for your bi- bicep, the one muscle contracts, the other relaxes and lengthens. You got that? Uh, yep. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. so you, you do tent, – tent your biceps. Your bicep your – bicep <laughs> Where's this is, going? <laughs> your bicep's contracting, your triceps then lengthen and relax. And so muscles work in pairs. And so your glutes, the the um, pe- so you the pair to your glutes is your hip flexors and um, adductors. And so, uh, like there's this. So oh, how do I explain it? The message from the brain, if you're if you've got really tight hip flexors and adductors, it's almost like those muscles are constantly on. So the brain thinks that those muscles. Are contracting which means the glutes have to relax because you can't you can't have both muscles on at the same time so if your hip flexors are over tight and are, and are always on along with your adductors it doesn't matter how many glute exercises you do you can't actually turn them on because of the because of the messages from the brain to the glutes i'm sure there'll be some physios out there that can that that have just throw their phone away yeah no, no. <laughs> anyway, that's they yeah, just so crush. They just stamp their headphones in the ground, saying, "I'm not listening." To this so I think show. I need to make sure my hip flexors, because my hip flexors are super tight to the point that, like, I'll finish a long run and I'll be on the couch, and my hip flexors will actually lock up on me and start cramping. It's because they're just over overworked. So while ever they're overworked, your glutes just can't activate anyway. So I need to loosen those off, and then start the glute activation type stuff. So anyway, that's. Jeez, got deep into that theory. Yeah, he's done some googling today. Have you guys never, you guys like never heard of this sort of stuff? No, I just, oh, just, I just run. Sorry, I don't, I don't have a, we, don't have a physio amateur, degree. Amateur medical Brady, doctors. Yeah. <laughs> see, Brady, you were exactly how I've been like my whole running life. Like if if I was on the podcast five years ago, I'd be like, oh, I don't know, maybe that's true. I I wouldn't know because as you said, you just go out and run. And you just take it for granted that these muscles automatically fire for you and can, mm. and keep keep your pelvis stable. But when you'll know when that doesn't happen because you feel absolute garbage. Um, and it's just, I think you notice it more when you've actually been, you've had decent 
pelvis stability in the past, yeah. which I've obviously had at some point. And that's where like the gym work's more important the older you get to, isn't it? Yeah. So gym gym work and activation stuff's going to be more important, I think, for me moving forward. So um, anyway, hopefully a physio can either write in and tell me I was full of shit or... Uh, <laughs> oh, they, we're going to get some messages. Don't worry. <laughs> they agree with me. Um, so yeah. Very good. All right, over to you, Moose. Only one upload on Strava this week, so we got a bit of a sneak peek, but that's all we know. Um, well, on that, I've got, I've got some help for you, Moose, with Moose on the Loose this week, if you like. Oh, well. I, you do, you do struggle got a few, to come up with topics. I've got a few things I want to go Moose on the Loose with tonight as well. So come my on, one, come my on one, before I start. Come on. Right, my one this week is these blokes that just put up the – Hey, look at me sessions on Strava uh, and hide every, and and hide everything else. It's like you're either on Strava or you're off Strava. Don't just put up the good stuff. Yeah, get to Strava because he doesn't like the attention, but then yeah. uploads the most attention seeking run of the week. And then yeah. people are like the king is back. Welcome back, big moose. Where else am I gonna get my confidence from? Return of the king. You Welcome think back. Clapping me on the end of the runs? <laughs> well she is. Uh, but so, that, anyway. So, Hell yes, yeah, happy moose. to see you back. I think it's a good moose on the loose topic. It's a very solid flex. When I saw that pop up on August 14th, I was like, ooh, he's fit. Another one today, though. Today? Nah. Yeah. Nah. Anyway. Yeah, go and have a look at today's session. Mondays. Hang on, So moose. what day am I starting from here? Monday you tell August... us about last Monday. August 10. Oh, jeez. Right. I just saw today's, Brad. You got a bit of a sneak peek of that. August mm. 10. He's like the fittest um... guy on the surf coast. Anyway, sorry, August 10. August 10, I ran. Um, you can see this one if you follow on Strava. Can you know why I do it? Is because it's really nice to. I, th- I think, why does someone need to see my 7K slow as fuck run around Anglesey where no one gives a shit about that? You want to see someone's training, I'll put the stuff up that matters. This is moose, the training moose. stuff. Nah. If, the foot, if the foot was on the, on the other foot, and you saw some other bloke doing this, you would tear them to shreds going, look at this fuckwit. Look at him just putting up the good stuff. I don't do that. I don't talk like that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but I think it's important to see the whole picture to see where these workouts fit into a week, and you need to know, like, what you do the next day for recovery and things like that. Who? No one needs to know that. I do this every day. I only just post it every second. I only just post a couple a week. (laughs) Um, are you just lot- hang on just before you start? Are you using like a diary to document your other training? I've got Garmin Connect still, so it goes to Garmin Connect. I'm still running with GPS watch, yeah, because how good a training just, diary is though? It just goes into Strava and uh makes it on private, just puts it on private, yeah, before, no, I just before it gets four, it. 400 kudos, <laughs> yeah, it just downloads the GPX file, or whatever it is. Yeah, I appreciate seeing blokes' workouts on Strava, and that's I don't care. Honestly, don't care that much about their easy recovery runs. I, I like this is a great system to clear out all the shit from Strava. If you only saw like the key workouts, and if you only saw the actual sessions that uh, I'm interested in, then that would be magic. I'm just helping Strava out. You know yeah, what else does people's heads in when you upload like your warm up and your cool down separately? Oh, exactly. Well, yeah, they're separate files, so they're going to have to. Yeah. So I'm saving people from that garbage too. Oh, what about guys that, that have a have a separate one? For, see if they're doing eight k oh, reps yeah. each rep. Yeah. Josh, Josh Johnson does that, and I always message him just saying enough Strava, enough Strava spam. Like, how, stop. how have you not worked your watch out yet? It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> not that hard. Um, Anyway, I did a long run. So I ran, uh, what did I even do this day? Gee, I've got it pulled up here. So I ran, um, it feels like ever, forever ago. So I, I ran uh, 18K. I think I did 12K with Ali to begin with. She was just doing an easy run. So yeah, I did 12K. Oh no, I did 18K. Oh, um, I mean, yeah, I missed this one as well. Sorry. Yeah. There you go. So I've done 18K um, at 403s. Um, heart rate was 136. I did have a heart rate on for this run. I was looking at it. I wanted to stay easy for the first bit. So 18K, 136 heart rate, 403s. And then I um, I planned to kick it down. So when I left Ali, I, oh no, I think I left, I, I, at 18K, I, I, I hit lap. So I changed my, um, changed my focus a little bit. And I was going to progressively run a bit quicker. 
uh, which I did. Um, I went, I don't have the splits. Oh, wait, it's on Strava, right? So I'll yeah. be able to tell. Yeah. Got him here. I noticed okay. you, you hit the heart rate too, Moose. Hit that heart rate went up for sure, yeah. No, you um, hit it. You hit it from Strava. Threw it in the bush. Heart I rate might only got pulled off. What, it didn't show up? No. Oh, so when you manually up, it must Oh, because I only I only uploaded the GPX file. Um, which so if which only, is the thing you were going off at people two weeks ago about people just uploading the files. Remember when Strava what? was down? You were like, who would oh, actually take no, the time no, 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 to download no. those files and upload them separately, yada, yada? No, no, you no, guys no, no. are psychopaths. This is different. This is different. This is totally different. Sounds no. like exactly the same thing. Anyway, I run, I don't know, you can see on Strava, I ran, um, it doesn't count the laps on Strava, I don't think, either. It didn't no, it show that it's two laps. So, yeah, so I basically ran two laps. The first lap was um, at 136 heart rate. The second lap, was at 164 average. Um, I averaged 325s. It was 14.7k, and um, yeah, so finished 33k. The, it was over hills, um, so the, I think I, it wasn't that hilly. I mean, it was just in the bush out behind, or the bush farming area out behind um, Balbray. We call it Paraparat. Uh, so two hour, five minutes, it was good to get a long run under the belt. This was a bit of a tester for me because my, this was only a few days after that cortisone injection into my foot. So I was, I was still a little unsure how that would um, play out. I had some orthotics in the shoes, so it was really a, a, a bit of a precarious one, this workout. And I went a bit too early. I was supposed to just kick it down the last 10 K, but I ended up kicking down nearly 15 K worth and, um, and probably went a bit too quick too, uh, because if you see the elevation profile of the run, I, I go up a hill right when I'm trying to kick down and it, it, it just destroyed me because my heart rate kept going up and I was wondering, I didn't realize it was a hill and I, run, I was wondering how bad I was going. Um, and I just kept wondering, like, I had to, like, it just, and then I got a stitch and I was like, this is fucked, I'm not fit anymore. Rah, rah, rah. And then I got to the peak of the hill and all of a sudden I was like, oh, hang, hang on, I'm back here. Um, so I dropped a couple of faster Ks late and then, um, yeah, so end up 33 K three forty-fives. uh, good, good first workout back for me. Have um, you, have you, sorry to interrupt, have you said what your average for that last 15 K, what pace? Oh, 325. 325. And then what was your heart rate average for the last bit? The 164? 100, no, it was a bit more than that. Um, 164. <laughs> yeah a bit more than that um yeah so that was good it was good to have a nice long run i hadn't done a 30k plus run in oh i don't think i've done a 30k plus run since back when i was back when i was april london so that was really nice to to get one in the under the um belt brie rode with me helped me out she that was nice of her um and then uh, the next day, I, it's not on Garmin. I forgot my watch didn't start, so I ran 8K with Bree in the morning, 12K in the afternoon on uh, Lake Wendouree. Ran with um, Mona, had a good chat to him actually about um, sort of sort of got his take on on what people are doing right now and um, how like he's been actually he's been hit up for a lot of like motivational talks. I'm surprised you haven't actually Brady given like your um, career as a professional motivational speaker based on bradythrowful.com. Mm, yeah, no, I have actually just, uh, oh, you have? yeah, yeah. been yeah. getting, been getting a lot of requests, but down on the yeah. front line to remote learning kids. But yeah, so minus, he basically said all these workplaces are seeing a real drop in morale lately, real kind of low, um, like low quality kind of vibes around the place. So he's been going around giving motivational talks and he said he wasn't really thinking about it, but basically the, where it's at right now, everyone can go around and train when they're on fire and when it's all easy and everything. But really the, those are the training now and doing a lot of work. It's uh, the hard time, like when everyone's struggling, like this is a time where you got it, like when it becomes difficult. And he, he was talking about resilience, that kind of thing. Good chat, anyway. Mm. So you summed it up well just then. Did I? Yep, I think so. Like these people who are training through this period and have been doing so for 15, 20 weeks, like they're the resilient people. Mm. Yep, 
and it will pay off for them. I guarantee it. Next year, there's going to be some people out there when it's all so much easier to train, they're going to, they're going to cash in on the work they're doing. Yeah, and even if they don't, like say they have a freak injury or whatever, like they still should be super proud of how they got through this period with their running. Yeah, yeah, um, I agree. And it's good to see it. And there's a lot out there. Uh, ran with Watto the next morning, um, 16K. And Bree was there for half of that. We we ran too fast on the way back. He runs like 6K a week. So this was, <laughs> this was he's always fresh. Uh, got out in the evening for a short one, 8K. Next morning, again, 8K again, um, down in Anglesey. And that afternoon, met um, Matt Gunther from Geelong. He's a bit of a protege of mine, Matt Gunther. He, we, we met in Freshwater Creek, so out in the, um, the farming area. It's, it's about 10 minutes from Geelong, but it's just untapped running potential out there, just dirt roads. Really reminds me of the back roads of Boulder. Um, it's just no cars, kind of undulating. Yeah, is this the nice. big block you've got near the Garang Garang Bushland Reserve? Is this this day? 14th? Yeah, it would be. No, this is the 17th. Uh, no, you haven't got excited. You know, that's the big workout. That's the long run day. Yeah, you'll know when that you know that one. Sorry, continue. Anyway, getting lost I'll here. Continue. I'll continue. Um, so yeah, we we were out there and we went we ran much too quickly. So we ended up averaging 351s for an our easy run. And I, I thought I made a 16. Well, I did. I had a 16, 16K loop made, but then I got lost when I was out there and I ended up, we ended up going 18.7K. So 2.7K too far at a much faster pace. Luckily, it was just a brilliant afternoon. Um, the sun was out. It was probably like 16 degrees. I took my shirt off. Oh, it was just heaven running. So it was, it was nice to stay out a bit longer. Um, the next morning... This is the workout that I did with Ali. We ran 2K. So we went to the para, para, para sort of bushland area again, farming area. It's like a, so there's a, there's one block. It's 12 kilometers. It's hilly, um, hilly kind of uh, sort of terrain, half asphalt, half um, dirt, the loop. So, when I mean half, I don't mean like a mix of both. I mean, there's patches there that are asphalt and patches that are dirt road. And so Ali had a 14K tempo that she was supposed to run that marathon effort. And I did that with her. So we did 16K. She averaged like 336, I think, for her um, 14K, which is pretty good over those, over those hills. It was sort of the same loop I did on the Monday when I did that tempo at the end of my long run. And then I got after it after that. So I um, had a workout to do. This was Ali's um, workout for me. It was five sets of 2K at half marathon to marathon effort with 1K float. I think I put this one on Strava, but you can't see the splits that well. Oh, you can actually because um, yeah, I only yeah. ran to the Ks. So yeah, yeah that's pretty good. That, that'll show us. Um, so I ran, I, again, it's hard to get the, the hills right, so I had to run a bit more to effort than anything. So the first K was uphill, 304s felt really difficult. I was like, why is this so feeling so hard? And then um, the next K I went down, 305s, pretty flat. <laughs> Floated downhill, 322 for my float. Then I went down 16 metres on the next K and ran a three-minute K, but got a spiky, sharp uphill and downhill for 312 so i averaged 306 for the next 2k block the float was 325 uh then i averaged like 305 306 for the next one but i was starting to feel it a bit i was actually like this was starting to get a bit difficult this workout 327 the float and then i averaged 310 for the fourth i was lucky to get through that it was uphill um again i didn't realize it was uphill at the time i was just thinking i was really battling uh floated 333s and then finished at like 307s, the last um, rep. Didn't float it. It was a bit of a battle, actually. So I finished kind of hands and knees stuff, um, 14K for 312s for that second section. So 30K all up. I'm not sure what it – yeah, it broke it into two two runs. I'm not sure what the average for the 31K. Oh, it cooled down and 
So, um, yeah, it's a good work. It's actually a pretty good workout that in the end, when I look back on it, at the time I was working outside of my, like my comfort zone a little, but that was, I didn't, I really underestimated how much that um, first 16 took out of me, the hilly kind of tempo with Ali. Although it felt super cruisy when I was doing it, I probably didn't respect it enough as to what it would do to the rest of my body when I tried to do those 2K reps. And um, yeah, I felt that. <laughs> Felt that pretty good. Did you have a heart rate monitor on for the workout part? Uh, I didn't have it for that one. Um, I get a bit scared to put heart rate on when I work real hard because I feel sometimes yeah. I get a stitch from it. Oh, well, I blame the stitches on the heart rate all the time because um, I got a stitch the last time that I worked hard in that long run and, and I had a heart rate on, so I just canned it. And I don't know what I would say. It would have been high. It would have been fucking real high. But... It got done. That's the main thing. And I think blowing up a little bit in some of those longer runs, those longer efforts, isn't isn't too bad of a, a um, an outcome. But uh, yeah, so just jogged for the rest, rest of the week. I jogged that night, 6K, pulled up a little sore through my OP, actually, um, through, through my groin, my adductor. Uh, woke up the next morning, got a bit of Dr. Orange, sunset run, 12K, pretty slow. So for those 445 per K, that's what pace I was running. That's unheard of in Kroger land. Um, that's 12K. And then in the, in the evening, got back uh, and ran with Bree in the dark after work. That's always the toughest run of the week. And then Sunday morning, ran again, did Bree's long run with her. She ran 18.2K. So we did that over some hills and got out 7K in the afternoon. And um, yeah, workout this morning, which we can talk about next week. But I think I ran like 100 87k which is which is good considering how fucked my body was <laughs> uh, like the week before um i was scraped that together somehow and now i'm feeling pretty good no um soreness coming to this week oh there's always soreness um it's just managing it now it's got uh, so i got seven weeks from sunday and it's about managing soreness for for a month and then um just sharpening or not sharpening but like fresh like trying to get rid of the soreness <laughs> seven weeks from yesterday that sunday or this sunday um seven, seven weeks, weeks from yesterday, yesterday from yesterday 48 days to go and it's this is like the meat and potato stuff right now you can't get out of this this is the time you need to be running before a marathon mm. it's gonna mm. be exciting following this build up brad <laughs> Yeah, shame we can't. We'll only find out once a week. We won't be able to follow it in real time. Ah, once he puts two good workouts up, we'll get a couple of updates between <laughs> now and next week. Why do you care how it, my, what my seven k run looks like tomorrow morning? Because no, you get a vibe yeah. by the whole week. Like you know, if well, well normally you would put something up, you'd you'd say, "Oh, I'm sore" or whatever. Like you'd, you know, you'd often give a bit of feedback on the title of your run. Yeah, well, maybe I just, maybe I don't want you. I don't want the insight out there. I'll just I'll deal with my own insights. If you had have looked at my insight the last two weeks, sore hip, sore foot, sore hip, sore foot. Nice morning, good run. Sore hip, sore foot. Orange doctor. Doctor Orange, Doctor Blue, get me through. All right, at this stage, put a percentage on it. You're you're ninety five percent going. Hundred percent going. Hundred percent going. Flight, flight, flights are done. Yeah, but you'll still just cancel the flights if you get injured or something, won't you? Or you're not in shape. Um, no, nah, I'll, I'll, I'm in shape. Yeah, that's I'm what I'm saying. Sh- that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's why I was like 95. Like you, yeah, you're definitely going. I'm 100. I'm 100 percent going unless they revoke my invitation. Which, um, that's why I'm. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that's a chance or not, but let's hope it doesn't. Is that why you're just putting the good sessions up on Strava in case somebody goes, oh, this guy's, this guy's still fit? Oh, let's check his Strava. Yeah, he's put a big dog session on there. That's right. Ooh, this bloke's good. Yeah, put him in the front pack. Keeps off the 445 <laughs> joggins. Let's introduce him in the front line. Here's Ali of Kipchoge, Kanin Issa Bekele. And, oh, this bloke's been running real well on Strava. <laughs> oh, yeah, good gags. Monday, 12K in the morning. Yeah, the morning, 6.03 a.m., 4.29s. Didn't run Monday, Arvo. Not sure why. Must have got uh, busy with life or something. 
Tuesday morning got out for uh, 9k at 4.14s. That's good for me in the mornings at 6 o'clock. Means I got a bit of pop and I've recovered from the Sunday long run. In the afternoon, did some 400 metre reps on a straight road. You ever done this, boys? Yep. Oh, yeah, I've done it before. Mentally, they're weird, aren't they? Like, we put a cone down for the start, 100, 200, 300, and, and the end. And it is, it's just weird. It's hard to judge your pace, and obviously, you get to look at your watch through every uh, 100, but it's just a, it's an odd feeling, I find. I always find them difficult to do in a straight line like that. Did three sets of 400 with 400 jog between every set. I think we averaged uh, 64 seconds, which is what was asked of us. And yeah, it was good, like, like right on the limit. Like it's a good workout where probably didn't want to do much more, but felt like we'd done enough work for the night. Um, a weird kind of like crosswind where, yeah, it was hard to, like you almost had to be on training partner's shoulder to kind of get a bit of a windbreak when you weren't leading them. But um, it was good. I bet you worked that out pretty early and put the kid out there every rep. <laughs> Uh, we did two each actually, so one one up and back. That is one good thing about reps like this. When you go up and back, it feels like it's just one set, but you really get two done. And then you just have to do that again, and all of a sudden you're jogging 400. But um, nah, we, we led the same amount of reps there. Quick cool down, 2K, 433s. Uh, battled on Wednesday, no pop. I've tied on my Strava run the next day. Reckon maybe just on the hard road. Some some person can back me up here and just say, yeah, it hurts more doing them on a road than it does the athletics track. So I battled along at 4.37s in the morning for 7K. Got out for 18K in the afternoon at 4.29s. Midweek long run after work on tired legs. Pretty much started close to dark. Biggest drag of the week, these, long, these medium long runs. Just don't like them at all. You think you're about 45 minutes into it. You look down at your watch and you're like 17 minutes into it. Just seem to go forever. Something about like it getting darker too. Like when you do like these runs in the morning, it gets lighter. Things get happier. Mm, this, yeah, you don't do them in the afternoon. Yeah. You've got to get up early. Well, I should have. Well, yeah, I did the smaller run in the morning for some reason. And then you get home and it's just like, yeah, it feels like half the night's done. Anyway, that was uh, Wednesday, Thursday, 7K in the morning, 4.28. Uh, Gang Abuse, Magnolia, Song of the Night on Thursday night. Got out for 12K at 4.20s. We're still struggling Friday. Was, initially, I was going to try and do my second workout of the week Friday, but just uh, felt like the legs were still a bit busted up, so I decided just to jog 16K in the morning and do some strides, listen to the Road to Nowhere guys. A bit happened on that show, actually, obviously with the London announcement affecting um, Nick and Ali, and then um, Joel with the World Half getting cancelled as well, so they had plenty to talk about over there. Got out for a jog Friday afternoon, 4.20s, this is when we Strava blew up. 33 comments, Song of the Night, Nam Encore by Linkin Park and Jay-Z. Boys, what are your thoughts on it? Oh, the bit without Linkin Park's good. Yeah, but don't you think it's a good mashup? Like it just works together? No. Nah. It's not bad, but... It... They pull it off. Yeah, it's not bad. Anyway, early days, I thought I was going to cop a whole lot of criticism for this tune. And I want to stick to my guns. Whatever my favourite song is for the night, I'm going to put it up. Not just put up like, you know, things that are going to make people happy. And then anyway, a big, uh, a big turn. A lot of people got on or got on the bandwagon and backed me up with this good hit here. Saturday, second workout of the week. Three by 3K, three, three minutes jog in between. Um, instructions were to run three minute Ks to 305s. Um, pretty fresh by the time we got to Saturday. Have them worked out on Tuesday. Hit 859, 859, 856. Been testing out locations, Bradley, for the Moama Half Marathon coming up in a couple of weeks. And I tested that road that we are talking about the uh, last week, Thyra Road. And I think it's going to cause us a few dramas because it's not that good quality. I'm not sure if you guys in like white collar locations have got like those dodgy farming roads that have like little holes and stuff in them. And like puddles just sit in them. And it had a bit of rain the night before and it was just wasn't good to run in. So well, gonna... considering though your goal was to break my PB, my PB was in Christchurch, which is very sim- like, there's Mate, perfect similar. Perfect roads, probably, probably four-lane no. highways or something. No, so if, actually, if you go back to the recap of that week, it was um, going through those uh, like sporting ground car parks 
where you have the potholes and the Craig, stuff Craig like that. Craig so. to this recap once a week. <laughs> <laughs> to, to remind myself. If you go back, it's episode number 36. <laughs> and from 43 minutes to 48 minutes, I talk about the road surface. The, uh, yeah, no, the surface was not good. So um, there you go. It could be perfect, Brady. Make it, oh, okay. make it even. It's just to be, yeah. I, well, anyway, I'll talk about Sunday in a second. This workout was um, probably a bit difficult than I thought. It was a bit of a stretch. Like, what just, were you supposed to run? What pace? Yeah, three minutes to three oh five. So I'm pretty much hit three oh, minutes. Yeah. yeah, so you run pretty quick each time. Yeah, yeah, right on. Like trying to trying to hit those nines and it's not in the range at all. But but yeah, eight fifty nine. Yeah, well, one second ahead. Just missed it. Um, 3 to 305, your range was 9 to 9.15. Yeah, and I hit 8.59, 8.59, 8.56. You had 15 seconds over 3K and you couldn't get inside it. Yeah, but I think a bit of a confidence booster. We wanted to be at the fast end. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was, yeah, well, I, I knew about it's it a bit, then. It's a really tough workout. I had str- I had trouble, but I ran much faster than I was supposed to. <laughs> this is the guy that loves fifth gear. <laughs> I was talking to you guys about our love training yesterday. How about complaining about a hard workout when you run faster than your prescribed mm. pace on each rep? But that's the problem, Moose. You prescribe this based on training in fourth gear, and because Brady likes fifth gear, it's just that little bit quicker. Nah, yeah, yeah this one, I probably only had one gear left. I had a one kick finish at the end of this one. Held together all right. Anyway, that will, that will keep me in uh, good form for this half marathon in a couple of weeks. That's a good half marathon workout. When we go back to 305s, 306s, it should feel pretty comfortable after doing that. Um, got out in the afternoon, 8K, 428s. Sunday long run. Um, went back out that direction. People playing at home. Thyra Road, Paracuda Road. Then took a right-hand turn on, I think it's Hillside Drive or something like that. Not sure why I called Hillside Drive because there's no hills in the whole town. Um, and then we, we got too far out to turn around because we thought, oh, if we turn around here, this is like we're only meant to do 30K. Um, it's going to end up being like 33K. Anyway, we hit the highway, ran along the highway, which was a bit stupid, like this is the main highway, and we're just kind of on the white line, and then come back in this dodgy dirt road, and it ended up being 33K. But um, So, yeah, we overcooked the loop there, averaged uh, 406s, um, which was quite surprising. I said to Archie when we were uh, started, I'm like, hey, we did a workout yesterday. We don't need to go that quick today. Like, we can average 415s, 420s, and we're just talking and looked down and we watched about 10K and we're averaging 410s and kind of kept it similar there. So uh, 33K, 33 33.5K, week was 160 something, 164, which is good. I think I've done like 10 weeks or like 170 average or 165 average. So. Feeling... When's your half marathon time trial then? Two weeks. No. Yeah, two weeks like yesterday, like 12 days when we're recording this, which would be all right. Two weeks. So, haven't, uh... you ske- haven't you scheduled it, Moose? Yeah. yeah you you but... can't remember people's programs off the top of your head though, can you? Uh, I was mainly asking him for the benefit of the uh, listeners actually, Brad. Uh, okay. Um, so, Brad, I need to do some negotiating here. I'm going to go up Thyra Road and take a right angle turn. You're right with that? Yeah. You're happy? Yeah. yeah. And then I'm going to take another right angle turn. I'm going to do two turns in 21 Ks. You okay with that? That's fine. And I'm going to run 100 metres over. Mm. <laughs> I just don't want it to come back and bite me here and you're not going to, well, you're not going to accept it. You're, um, are you seriously going to put this in as your PV? I'm not going to put, no, it's going to be an inside running podcast record though, but not my PB on Strava, no. Well. I'm claiming the record though. uh, Okay, yeah. I'm going to try and wipe Uh, you off the record board altogether. Then I've just got to get Moose's marathon and it's just a clean slate. Good luck. Yeah, I think I'm going to need it. So Brad, are we all right with that? Yeah, it's fine. Two right hand turns. 100 metres over. I don't care, really. It's not, it's not an official, it's not an official anyway. time anyway. You're so the kind of guy that will br- a- you'll bring this up in six months' time. Like that's yeah. Do whatever, do whatever you want. All right, that's good. No, because I said well, I, had a per- I had a perfect course, but you were saying there's too many. Run 19K. Other people in the country would probably run a 19K claiming a half marathon PB in the last six months. Yeah, but I, want to be, I don't want to be like them, Brad. I want you to get re- this to get recognition. Anyway, let's thank some patrons. We'll give them some recognition. Kick us off, Bradley. All right. Uh, my shout out this week is to Geggy Espidal. He's from Oslo, Norway, but I think that's actually his nickname and his real name is Kai Eric Espidal. 
um, based on his Facebook profile. He runs, he cooks, he drinks beer, listens to rock music, and loves a tattoo. Brady's put a photo up here. He's got, uh, there's not a lot of uh, vacant space there. Loves a tat, and he's uh, downing a beer on the track. So, um, and his PBs are 39.40 for 10, 87 for the half, and 304 for the marathon. He's training to break three hours. And um, as Brady has mentioned here, has good swagger. So thanks for your support. Oh, yeah, it's rare I put a photo in. Probably only done it three or four times over the years. But, uh, yeah, yeah, Gaggy's got some real good swag and some good ink there. And would go good in a street fight by the looks of him. Oh, uh, I was going to say... Who deleted uh, his photo? I just took... Re- I got rid of it because I, I I looked at it. We already saw it. Yeah, I thought we could leave it in there. Anyway. Leave it in for the whole night. Yeah, would have been good put to it, look at Gaggy. Put it in the show notes. We'll keep it in there. Uh, who are you thinking, Moose? <clears throat> Kelly Jansen from... The uh, distance running mecca of Australia, Bakery Hill in Victoria, which is actually Ballarat, but Bakery Hill has the big McDonald's, the old school Maccas, if you've ever been to, been to McDonald's in Ballarat. She's, um, she's a great runner, actually. She's run 11.05 for 3K, 18.59 for 5, 39.57 for 10K, 129 for a half marathon, and 3.11 for a marathon. Um, so did Great Ocean Road Virtual Marathon as a debut around the streets of Ballarat in May in 3.11. So, yeah, well, would clearly go quicker in an actual race. Great Ocean Road is quicker than running around the streets of Ballarat, that's for sure. Uh, she's a mum of two babies and three dogs. Did you put those in, no, those emojis? I, I just copy and paste them from a Strava bio. Oh, right, okay, yep. That'd be kind of weird if I put them in, I reckon. <laughs> I know, you've confused me. Why would you? Um, mother, mother of two humans and three dogs. So, yeah. Thanks, Kelly. Do you want to thank your other mate too, Moose? Paul oh, Rogan? Oh, yeah, Rogues. Paul Rogan from Alfredton in Victoria. He, um, I think he was a good footy player, Paul, back in the day. But now he's a runner. 1850 Ballarat Park Run, 3946 10K. 126 half marathon, both that run for a cause, very fast place to run a half, and has at least two kids, um, can confirm has kids. Uh, Paul, run stronger, good fella, accountant. Oh, yeah. He'll be, he'll be riding this patron off as a tax expense or something, then you reckon? Yeah, you'll find a loophole for sure. Good support coming out of Ballarat, two from the three. Yeah. A lot of expendable income. Yeah, high socioeconomic down there, aren't they? Yeah, it's class. Real class. Can you guys hear that dog barking in the background here? Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that, listeners. It's me neighbours. Can't do much about it. I'll uh, maybe turn my mic off when I'm not talking from now on. Uh, Runner news, boys. Monaco Diamond League, do you want to start there? Did you get up for it for starters? You didn't, Brad, I don't think. Moose and I, we were up. Uh, I got up for the five, the men's five. I couldn't go any earlier. I actually saw the last two laps of the eight, uh, 15, so that was nice. Yeah, I got up for the 15, which I think was like 4.50 a.m. kind of thing, whereas the uh, women's five, I missed that. And I didn't have any spoilers either. I kind of turned my phone on and I was like, okay, just maybe don't pay much attention to this. And then not much came through that was going to give the result away. And then I watched the 15 and the 5 live and then went back and watched the 800 and the 5K without knowing the results, which was good. Um, the biggest story out of the night was obviously Jessica Hull. The biggest Australian story out of the night was Jessica Hull finishing fourth in the women's 5K. She broke the Australian record. She ran 1443.80. Previous Australian record was 1447.60, set by Benita Willis in Berlin in the year 2002. That record's been there for a while. What do you think, Moose, of your uh, teammate from Doha? Oh, yeah. Well, I didn't actually – I haven't watched the footage yet. Um, well, you don't see much of her, which is disappointing. Like they yeah, just, yeah, I heard that. Um, yeah, Brie got up Brie got up and watched it. So she sent me a message when I woke up, and she was like, oh, Jess, oh, she did it. Um, it was pretty, pretty amazing, really. 14.43, this is the start for Jess Hull. I don't think this is – like, 14.43 is a great run. Um, obviously, it's the fastest Australians ever, an Australian has ever run. But I'm, I'm thinking Jess is like a 1430 girl, really. Mm-hmm. I think we're just starting to see the, the tip of the iceberg for, for Jess. She could be our best Australian distance runner ever. Yeah, I think this was only her third 5K. 
I'm pretty yeah, sure. Exa- exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, like she had a few people around, didn't she? But and and when they went, when the like Abiri and Gide went, um, obviously Jess couldn't go with them. But she, well, she came second in the next pack. Shannon Robbery beat her, but yeah. So she's, yeah. She's, no, she beat she, Shannon. Uh, yeah, she was oh, in front she? of Robbery. Yeah. Oh, who beat her then? Who beat Jess? Uh, there was a British girl who Laura, went with the pack. Laura, Laura, oh, Laura, Laura, yeah, sorry, Laura. Yeah, yeah, Whiteman. that was pretty gutsy. Her run. Laura Waitman beat her. Yeah, yeah. You could almost argue though that this was her first proper five k because I, I'd imagine like the one here that she did in Australia, like that was pretty much like a sit and kick at the end. Um, but this was the first one where she had like really committed the whole way and pretty much put it all out there. And as you know, like the five thousand is a brutal event, so. This will only make her stronger, and, and she'll she'll keep improving over the five. That's for sure. Mm. And off the plane as well, I guess. Never sure. Like you know, usually it takes them a couple of rust buses over in Europe to get it right. Whereas she's rocked up and got it right the first time. I did have some notes here. Like she seems to execute well on the big stage um, every time. Like she's a big time performer. We saw that with her like NCAA's kind of our uh, performances there, and she's just kind of fitted into this pro scene. Like, no worries at all. Like, her at the World Champs, she just missed the final over there. And now she's coming fourth in Diamond Leagues, which is um, which is pretty amazing. Like, I went back and had a look at what date we had her on the show. And that was like, oh, it was pretty much 13 months ago. She hadn't announced who she'd signed with yet. She'd just come out of college. A kind of a bit of an unfamiliar name other than people that kind of f- followed the um, college scene. And now she's, well, I think she could be the next, like, running household name for just generally sport in australia she's mm. got that x factor like she's got that Mottram, that you know bonita like yeah kathy freeman like she could do something special on the world stage and, and get recognition across all sports just yeah i totally agree well we saw it like a few of the major news outlets did cover that world record so that's pretty cool it's always nice to see a um at, like a distance runner get get on mm. a uh I don't know, whatever, fucking news.com.au, whatever it is. Well, she was on, Jess was on the news tonight actually here um, because we have like a local news for half an hour before the national news. And because she's from Wollongong, we get um, like, I guess the the local news covers the Wollongong area. So Mm. they had a, they had a uh, segment on her basically saying that, yeah, she'd broken the Aussie record. And um, so that was good to see. Yeah, cool. Mm. That's, yeah, that's nice. So good. Uh, Jen Gregson was in the same race. She was eighth in fifteen thirty eight. Went with the pace early, like she was with them through a K, and I think they were like two fifty two. Um, dropped off a bit there throughout the second half of the race. Probably hasn't run many five Ks as well. Like trying to think. Obviously, the three K steeple. She's got the Australian record there as well. Last um, Olympics, she ran the five. Did she run the five? Did she? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know why I was thinking she hadn't run many fives. Yeah, she's she's run the Olympics. Um, men's 800, Peter Bowl was 7th in 144.96, Joseph Dean was 10th in 146.20. Any comments there, boys? Fast race. Brazier. I didn't see it. Brazier, didn't I call Brazier? Mm. Bowl, Bowl was competitive in that one. He was um, he was right in it up until uh, probably like 150 to go. He was certainly looking pretty good. So And like 800s, like first... First race of the season, Rust Buster. It's um, not a bad start, 144.96. Mm. Uh, men's 1500. This was a bizarre race. You guys seen this one? I saw the last two laps. Oh, you missed the, the good first lap. They went through in 52, Chariot. Um, and he went with the two pacemakers. And I think he was he was four or five seconds ahead of the chase pack, which Jakob Ingebrigtsen was leading. And, um, yeah, and then slowed, and then they nearly caught him, and then they did catch him, and then he moved away from him in the home straight. Like, I thought they were going to gobble him up and go straight past him. But, um, yeah, they didn't. And then, like, they ran 328. Yaka broke the European record. Pretty crazy um, times. And just seeing the way it unfolded, like, they just did things the complete opposite way to get that 328 next to their name. And, and Jakob almost led that chase pack the whole way. Like, he didn't really get a sit. He was uh, kind of in charge of it. So pretty impressive running there. Um, Ryan Gregson, Australian, was in that race. He was in 12th in 335, 57th. And then the 5K, the world record went down. Joshua Chapter guy 
ran 12.35. Matthew Ramsden was pacing for the first 2K. He went through in 5.03. Got some good airtime as well after the other two paces dropped out. And the, big, mm. the big tall Australian was there leading the pack. And then Shepardy Guy pretty much picked it up almost like freakishly, obviously better than we've ever seen ever. Um, and just, yeah, looked smooth, didn't look tired. Crossed the line two seconds quicker than uh, Kenanishi Bikili's world record of 12.37. Set back in Hengelo in 2004. Only mistake he white- made was not wearing black socks. The white-, white socks really affected his swagger. But, um, yeah, really looked super smooth. Stewie was in the same race. He was six in 13.13. Um, and I think we've done a full wrap of the Australians there, boys. Tell me what you thought of Chepty Guy to start off with. Uh, impressive. The only the only downside of it was um, he never never saw the rest of the race. <laughs> there was there was no race. It was um, him him with his two three pacemakers, and then that was it. Just run away. Mm. But uh, metronomic is pretty much yeah sixty point every lap. Um, there's a real cool. I don't know who put it up, but I saw it on Facebook yesterday where they have split screen and they've got Bakili's race on one half and chapter guys on the other to see how they sort of where they were at, the, at different points in the race and um yeah Bikili closed quicker his last lap but um he only ran like 57 or something whereas chapter guy ran 59 but uh yeah isn't it amazing like what do you, it was like a 20 20 odd second pb i think his pb was 12.50 or something go, like going into it uh, yeah isn't it um isn't it boring watching a bloke just roll off 60 second laps like that or 61 second laps like yeah. just by himself i was watching going is this if i didn't if there wasn't a split showing up he could be running 60s or he could be running yeah. 65s and i wouldn't have any clue and we know he's going to win like we want him to get the world record or do we i'm not yeah. sure who i'm cheering for here uh it was just a bit of a strange watch I didn't really celebrate when he got it. Yeah, and it doesn't do it justice as to how quick the guy's running. Um, I remember uh, one episode a while back when um, Deng and Bowl ran the 800 in Canberra and Rory Hunter was in that race, who's like a 337, 1500-metre guy. But watching those guys in the first 200 compared to Rory Hunter gave you an appreciation of how good those guys are over mm-hmm. 800 Whereas you don't get that with Chepty Guy because, as you said, Moose, there's no one around him and the pacemakers are moving just as well as him. Um, and so if the average person who knows nothing about running doesn't really get an appreciation of how quick that guy is actually moving. Yeah. Yeah, when you think everyone else is out of the screen and they're the guys that will be in the Olympic final next next yeah. year um, and that's where he is right now, like so far ahead of everybody. And, yeah, uh, it, it, he's obviously... Nearly unbeatable, he won World Cross, he won Com Games double, he broke the uh, the 15k world record on the roads. Um, he he's doing everything really. World champs, he, Diamond League final. So, yeah, so world he, champs. That's so right. here's a question for you, Mo uh, Mo Farah was jumping back on the track at uh, well this year's Olympics, which is now next year. How uh, how does that look for Mo? Doesn't look good for Mo. <laughs> Chet the guy ain't the guy who's waiting around for the last 400 metre kick. Like, we've seen him run off the front a number of times. Um, yeah. Yep. He, Plus he, he, he grinds it. Kick. He's out kicked people in the Com games as well. Um, we've seen him bust, it, bust races open midway at the end and obviously he can go from the gun. He can do it however he wants. So, does Mo actually compete now or does he just ha- or does he hang up his spikes? Yeah, well, uh, who knows? Mo's got to like, stay relevant. Yeah. I know he's doing that hour thing soon, but, yeah. Maybe yeah, he's going... still a, a bronze. Yeah, I still got Borrega and those guys, though. There's some solid 5K guys getting around. Kajelcha. Because there's, not, oh, there's, there's not a lot of... Mo Ahmed. Mo Ahmed, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's not a lot of upside for Farah going over there and either, not, like, you know, finishing second, third, or not not even meddling. Like, it's not a, not a great way to bow out. Yeah, mm. I guess. Unless you look at it like a um say a footballer like i mean it's his career right Mm. so you continue your career going it means you're getting salary it means you're getting sort of bonuses along the way it means it gives you something to wake up for every day like you take running away from this bloke what happens like it's a really difficult transition out of um 
elite sport into like almost like just generic living or lifestyle. So it's it's difficult for these guys to transition back into sort of normal normal civilian life, I reckon, after they retire. So they probably want to extend it as long as they can. Very true. Coverage is terrible, boys. You got a world record attempt going on and we throw to the pole vault or the high jump or the long jump, which are all and probably amazing feats and take a lot of athletic ability. But if you're waking up at four thirty in the morning to watch a world record attempt, you want to see it happen. It's only going to go for 12 minutes. They need to work out a timetable and they need to work out a split screen. They need to work out something because it's just so frustrating when you're trying to be a consumer of the sport and they just take it away from you and don't give you any opportunity to view it. And then they need to have almost a split screen on the finish line as well to show other people in the race coming across. Like It's cool to see Chepty Guy... It's cool cool to see Chariot come across the line and win and what they're doing and how they're reacting. But there's big stories also coming across the line later in the race that we miss. And even, like, you've got to wait a couple of minutes to actually see the results pop up or look them up online yourself. It makes it very hard to be a fan of the sport. Mm-hmm. Anything else about that? We can go there every time, oh. every single time. But. And, and even the, like, the, the lead in promotion from some of our federations was ordinary. Like You look at that lineup, like, like at Ryan Gregson, Australian record holder, Stewie, second fastest all time, Jessica Hull goes on to break the Australian record, Rams then up and coming gun, Peter Boll, Joseph Ding, Australian record holder over 800, Jen LeCaz, Steve Trace, Australian record holder, current 10K champion. Like we've got, that's our dream team lineup. Is it not? Who else do you throw in there? Maybe a Morgan McDonald. Maybe yeah. an Ollie Hoare in the 15 Katrina as well. Katrina Bissett. Katrina Bissett oh, well, over the eight, yep. Lyndon Hall. Lyndon Hall. You don't, that's close to our dream team lineup. And then we just don't celebrate these guys or tell their stories enough leading up to the actual event to, like, I don't know, get people excited and stuff. I know there was that disagreement from AA that said they, they didn't support them going to the event, but I thought they could have maybe, I don't know, pumped up their tyres a bit more. Um, leading into it because there were some good stories. And, yeah, I know, Brad, you had some comments. I'm not sure if you want to disclose them here to 18,000 people. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I think they deserve better, these stars of our sport. Yeah. Well, the press press release going in was basically that these guys are going over there, but we don't support them and they're not getting travel insurance as a result. And then afterwards it's like, you know, oh, Jess Hull just breaks his Australian record and it's on AA Facebook page and, and Instagram. And it's like, well, hang on a second. Like, this wouldn't have happened if they listened to you guys. Like, you know, this is their this is their job. This is their career. And you're trying to make it as difficult for them as possible, not supporting them. And um, But now you want to celebrate that the Aussie, Aussie record's been broken. And if they, as I said, if they'd listened to AA, AA's advice, it would have never happened. Mm. Uh, anything more there, boys? You want to talk about before we move on to local stuff? No, local looking stuff. Forward to the next. Looking forward to the next one. Where's uh, was it Stockholm or something? Next Diamond League? Yeah, or Brussels. Is that that's where they're going for that hour record? I think. Don't know. Be coming up soon. South Australia cross country champs, boys. We got our predictions wrong in the women's last week. Tara Palm got up. 30, 34, 53. This was 10K. I thought, someone, I thought Croker picked her. Nah, he said after none of us picked her, she'll probably go and win it now. Yeah, because oh, I, I picked Jess, who um, Jess didn't start. And then, yeah, who did you pick, Moose? Caitlin? No, I picked no, Caitlin. Yeah, Izzy, Bat Doyle. Yeah. Like and I'm yeah. like, oh, yeah, and Tara will probably win now. And, uh, yeah, she did. She, she did. Her, yeah. 34, 53, Caitlin Adams second, 34, 58. Izzy, Bat Doyle, 35, 18. As you said, Jessica Senson didn't start, Brad. The men's Matt Clark, he got the win, 29.45. Riley Cox, second, 29.53. Adrian Potter, 30.03. Uh, some notes here from my correspondents over there on the ground. Clark broke Potter at 5K. They both dropped Riley. Then Riley picked off Potter in the last K and was flying home, but couldn't catch Clark. Big fields, they had their live stream going. I think our man from Shoe Geeks, Nitter, I think he won the veterans category again. Don't have those results written in front of me, but um, as I said, most weeks, South Australia doing some good stuff. Croaks, mm-hmm. you want to tell me something about Western Australian cross-country champs as well? Yeah, so they had their champs on the weekend. Uh, Rochelle Rogers uh, won the women's race in 38.29. Uh, Jasmine Long was second, 38.54, and Brittany Moore was third in 40.45. 
Uh, in the men's, Ben Chamberlain won in 31 33. Willie Chabor was second in 31 36. And Matt Smith was third in 32 18. So good to see those states are uh, able to race their um, state cross country chance. Because I know New South Wales has been uh, like cancelled or postponed till potentially September. So um, good work to those runners. And Moose takes over to the States for this last bit of running news. Yeah, well, this um, Ollie Hoare, who we've talked about before, he went to the, he went to Wisconsin and he did some big things there. But he is going to be a champion mm-hmm. for Australia. He's going to be one of – he's going to threaten records and he's going to make teams and he's going to make finals. Um, so he ran he, – we announced that he was running for that new on running group in Boulder uh, under Dathan Ritzenheim as the head coach, but he ran in the music distance carnival in Nashville, Tennessee, where he ran the 1500 and he went wire to wire in 334.63. PB of almost three seconds. Unfortunately for Hoare, it won't count as Olympic standard because we're in that blackout period of of qualifying. Um, That opens up on September 1st, I think, or October 1st. Isn't it like December 1st? No, they changed it. it. It went back. That's how London got, uh, London Marathon got. Um, I thought it was just for qualified. London, though. Oh, I'm pretty sure that they changed the okay. dates on it. Yeah, you know. Uh, well, damn, now you've got me. They wouldn't just change it for one. I'm pretty sure that they've changed the date that they've, they've brought it forward. Um, fuck. Oh, gee. Uh, anyway, I could be wrong. Even though that it's under the time of 3.35, yeah, it won't qualify with that. Morgan McDonald, who is flying at the moment too, is fifth in 3.37. Um, even though he might be a longer distance um, sort of athlete, that's still good running. But Ollie Hoare, yeah, keep an eye on this fella. Did you guys see the race at all? No. No, yeah. I did Yeah, because I um, follow like Tin Man Elite, their Instagram page, and so I knew it was coming up. So I got home from the long run and um, I watched pretty much all the races and it was incredible. He um, took off with the pacemaker and cleared out like he had 20 30 meters on the rest of the field so the the pacemaker pulled out at 800 and he ran the remainder on his own so to run 334.63 in in predominantly a, a time trial like the 1500 running from 800 to to the end by yourself is is hard to do so he um if he gets in one of these diamond leagues he'll he'll take seconds off that mm-hmm. so that was super impressive it was yeah him and, and daylight second. Mm. Yeah. Who was this uh, guy who won the um, the B race? Cam Griffiths from Australia. You guys heard of him? He ran three forty. Just turned pro yeah. with Tim Man Elite Adidas. So he's from Sydney. He um, went to Trinity Grammar School um, and was actually coached by Brad Woods. Um, so Brad Woods was a 337, 1500 guy coached by Ken Green. Um, would have been like two thousand and five ish, that sort of time, two thousand six. Um, and then he went over to the US and went to um, Arkansas. So he's finished up there and now he's signed on with uh, Tin Man Elite. So he's, uh, I think his PB's 339 and he ran 340 um, to win yeah, section two of the 1500 metre race. So much depth, depth in Australia in 1500 metres at the moment. Yeah, mm-hmm. and like you also so many, made the, yeah. the one thing that I always find really fascinating is like these athletes are talented. At, so like your, your Jess Hulls, your Ollie Hawes, your Morgan McDonald's, Cam Griffith, like they've obviously shown some talent here in Australia before they go to the US. But I would, like it seems like everybody that goes to the US at the moment just seems to take their running to a new level. And like it doesn't matter which college they go to, um, they all become really good racers. Uh, which says a lot about the system over there. Yeah, yeah. They, well, they race so often, and they race eight hundreds, and they race cross country, and they're they're in relays, and yeah. yeah, yeah. It is. It's what they used to do, I guess. If you look back at sort of the the Ron Clark, John Landy eras back here, uh, they used to race interclub every weekend, and they would they would do the same sort of thing where they would run for their club and practice racing. Yeah. They would get quite like I guess proficient at racing. Yeah, mm. and make and it makes it easy if like you know, as Brady said, like Jess always performs on the big stage. It's because she's just so comfortable at racing now because she's done it so often and doesn't sort of get overawed by the um, 
uh, by the situation because, like the NCAA, like some of those meets are, are pretty high pressure with you know people watching and um, you know the expectations of the college. So it's not a massive step up to go from that to pro meets. And I think that it really highlights there's so much more to being a successful athlete than just your physiology and your like the running that you're doing. So the practicing of tactical races and and having an intuition or now during a race as to know what to do, that's the same sort of thing as sort of a, a forward pocket in the AFL being like guys like Stephen Milne, Eddie Betts, like Ch- Charlie Cam, guys that can Leon Davis. like fight. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Guys that can find the ball, know where the goals are, know where the, to, to be at exactly the right time. It's this know when to put their bursts of speed in. Um, they, it's almost like they're sort of people are watching them and they're intimidating others as well. So there's so many aspects to running that we sort of, I don't think, give credit to. And even just like having the supreme confidence not to not to go too early in these races. And sometimes it's like Ollie Hoare to go with the pacemaker early, like having confidence, having people around you, I guess, um, giving you that confidence and sort of instilling like this self-belief. It's it's more important than just, I think that's what we're starting to miss now or we will miss as it, we accumulate running solo so often, doing time trials, doing solo workouts. We're going to, we're going to lose the touch for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. It's going to be, we're going to miss it. Um, and it's like, how much do we want to race right now? It's the, it's what, it's why we run. It's not why we run, but gee, it's nice to have an end game. And yeah, I, I got this impression when I I could have said it in the interview. I might have said it to you guys off air when I spoke to Jessica Hull that because they've got more worldly experience being based over there as well, they seem to have um, higher expectations that they can match it with everyone in the world, not just be super good in the Australia like bubble. Like, I just remember getting off air and she was like, I don't know, she just said stuff about being competitive with her training partners and, I don't know, I got this impression that she didn't want to just be the best in Australia, she wanted to be to try and mix it with Diamond Leagues and things like that. Like, I think they have a higher expectation of themselves when they come out of that American, um, yeah, system as well. Don't know, could be wrong, just an observation. Loose on the loose? Oh, no, loose the question. All right, so this um, question actually came in before Jess broke the national 5K record, but... We, we didn't think about changing it <laughs> between no, but, now and then. No, because no, then it's, we can, still, it's still relevant. It's still relevant, yeah. So anyway, the question comes from Tim N. Um, what will be the next Australian record to get broken uh, across for each gender, any event from 1,500 metres to the marathon? Who, what time, and where in the world? I'll, I'm happy to kick it off. I'll go um, I'll go Jess Hull, oh. the uh, women's 1,500. <laughs> Oh, I was going to say Jessica Hull next five k she runs. <laughs> I'll go. I'll go the fifteen hundred. She'll she'll take that one as well. Okay. Mm. Well, what about the marathon one? Yeah, I was thinking the marathon. You've got Sinead who could definitely do it in London. Um, she's she's. I mean, we, we've seen what she can do. She's there. If she gets the right pack on the right day, can happen. Um, You've got Brett and Jack as well. We, I guess there's going to be some good. It's it's a course made to go fast. Uh, Jack, I mean Brett ran sixty sub sixty minutes for a half. Clearly, like clearly coming into the prime of his road running career. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I mean the answer is Jess Hull in in pretty much whatever race she wants to. <laughs> the three k if she wants, um, that's there for the taking. It depends what en- what event she enters next. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'd have to say track stuff over because London's the only really opportunity that people have to race on the roads. Like you can't see the half going down because there won't be a half anytime soon. What about no. Stewie Men's Fifteen? Just well, missed I, it. Yeah, and I actually reckon Matt Ramston is a mm. is an outside chance as well. Um, like maybe Stewie will run a quicker fifteen hundred and break the Aussie record before Matt Ramston, but I reckon he will. Uh, well, he's certainly got the potential to break an Aussie record in the next couple of years. Monaco is usually the quick one, though, isn't it? Like something about that track in the 1500. Yeah, that's the record-breaking track. Mm. Thoughts on Ramston, Moose? 
Yeah, yeah. I just need to see that little bit. I need to see one more thing. I mean, the the 3K was amazing, the mm. 739. Um, I don't know. It's just, I, I, you need it. It would have been great for him to be in that 15, I reckon. Although, yeah, it would have been great to, to see him in that 15 at Monaco. But I was about to say, we missed the chance to talk about it. The job that he did pacing put him front and centre in front of the world and he he absolutely nailed it, his job. He, um, I, I reckon there would have been people all over the world going, who's this guy? How fucking good does he look when he runs? And he like he broke the world record and he was part of the team that did that. He'll be able to hang on, hang his hat on that for like, for a long, basically. He got a, um, he got a nice shout out in uh, Chapter Guy's Instagram as well. Thank you. Oh, did he? Yeah, yeah nice. Yeah. That's cool. Just... So yeah, he, He's starting. He's starting up, of course. Did you see Chapter Guy firing back tweets at people commenting on his shoes? Oh, yeah. Well, do you want me to? <laughs> this is Move getting old, loose. but yeah. fucking hell. <laughs> so it, the immediate thing that people were saying, like it happens every time, of course. What shoes was he wearing? What shoes? What shoes? Well, the best thing they did was someone put up a photo of Achilles' shoes that he wore and the new Dragonfly. And how similar do they look really when you put them together the concept is the same spike plate uh foam tiny amount the upper is pretty similar like there's nothing really that different about the two shoes except for like the type of foam they used and no one's mentioned it yet but bikili was wearing like a custom made spike they took a plate off one put it on another shoe whatever that's a that would be in breach of a prototype rule now so that that um, that shoe would be banned. He wouldn't have been able to wear it. No one's talking about that. Everyone's talking about, oh, this new shoe, rah, rah, rah. But the, from all accounts, from what I've seen, it doesn't even have a carbon plate inside it. It looks like, from what I've read, it has a foam plate. Like a, Basically, you can, you can make plates from different materials. Obviously, we've only ever really heard about um, carbon plates, or that's what's popular to talk about. This doesn't seem to have a carbon plate in it. Uh, from what I've read anyway, there's really limited um, tech information on the Dragonfly, even from like a retail perspective. Um, we normally get sort of pretty detailed tech on the shoes, but they've really, they've left off a few things with the Dragon. Uh, but yeah, it looks like it's just a foam plate or so, so a stiffer sort of high density foam through the, the shoe to give a plate feel and a rocket feel. What else? What are we just not allowed to use different foams now? We have to use foams from the 90s to, to make it even. It, it really, it's starting to really piss me off that like we're just not even giving any credit to, to Chep the guy, an amazing performance. This guy's, as he mentions in his tweet, he ran the world cross. He basically won every race that he's entered in older spikes. Now he's doing this in, in new spikes. Like it, the spikes aren't the difference. He's just an athlete that's exceptional and almost like well there's not much you can't you can't put much into the spikes because you're restricted by that 25 millimeters anyway which is not a not a whole heap so like there's obviously a bigger difference for the sh- for the road shoes like or the, the, there's been a bigger change in the road shoes than there has in the track shoes or track spikes because as you said like bikili was running in a shoe that looked very similar to um to chapter guy mm, yeah and it's just it's kind of just takes the edge off it takes the polish off it i mean good on chapter guy for getting into these people because fuck them you know like people back in the day dirty as shit taking all sorts of drugs right but we still want to make it even and we, we, we won't put a new shoe on because it's not fair to the guys that were taking like copious amounts of epo back in the day yeah um yeah and i got i like yeah the marathoners are taking sports drink on right Sports drink. They're not, they didn't take that back in the 60s or whatever. They didn't know what that was. So should we not take sports drink on to keep it air, to keep it even, like a level playing field? Like where do we stop give, like talking about advantage to athletes of the new era? And I'm sure there would have been other people in that 5K that were in those same spikes. Yeah, they, they were all women. But they, didn't, they, all, didn't they, all didn't out, they all didn't come out and run PBs. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's not about the fucking shoes. That's, and that's the point. Well, that's why I said that because it's... Yeah. It's yeah, like example, Lance Armstrong. Brad. Lance Armstrong, it's not about the bike. It, exactly. 
Yeah. Good. All right. Sounds like up. you've had your moose on the loose. Uh, yeah. That was Mine's... it. Was it moose? Yeah. You yeah. do that. Uh, <laughs> what's coming up, boys? Bradley, what are you doing? Uh, bit of running, bit of teaching. Um, that's about it. Nothing too exciting. Just living your best life, moose. Uh, yeah, marathon season. Marathon season, baby. We're, we're in the deep stuff. Mm-hmm. Prepping. Hey, when's um, the next Shoe Geeks episode coming out? Uh, I'm just nailing down the guest right now. Bit of a hard to get one. Got to go through channels for this. Mm. Got to make people happy. Bit political. Political. We're going to, yeah, we'll get it done. That's good. We'll keep, keep an eye out for that. Um, this week's interview, boys. Bit of a last minute change of plans listeners we did uh, have this episode all sorted monday night we had it uploaded to patreon so patrons you know who this guest is for next week now you're a week ahead we did make a slight change to this week's interview though because thanks to the guys at bankstown athletes club matt whitbread you've heard him on the show before he gave us access to some audio a bit of an interview that he organized with jessica hull we spoke about her a lot obviously in this episode fresh off fresh off that australian 5000 meter record so now we get to hear all about it from her uh, matt does a great job with the interview as always he's no stranger to the microphone so it's a really good listen as I said before, we're super grateful for this uh, conversation to be able to go onto Inside Running Podcast and hearing the insights straight from Jess. I think she's still over in Monaco. Maybe they talk about that in the conversation. So you're going to throw back now and hear us finish the episode and then into the Jessica Hull interview. Thanks, guys. See you later. And that means we're done, boys. Have a good week. We'll see you uh, this time next week. Thank see you, you, boys. Good oh, luck, Moose. Look bye-bye. forward to seeing the yeah. next uh, Strava workout. Friday, um, mate. Check in. Friday. You. Just keep Add refreshing, a, Brad. Add me on Garmin Connect if oh, I'm feeling you know, I'll whole, let you, you know a whole lot of people that will be sending you requests now. <laughs> oh, better Actually, change. Uh, oh, and can I also add, M- MBE is not being knighted, but it's... um. Yeah, it's a, it's an award, it's a high award, a bit like a, a, an Order of Australia or whatever. But it's uh yeah, MBE is not being knighted. Good, we got our facts right there after probably murdering a few of them throughout the last 80 minutes. All right, boys, we're done. Just show love to everyone you meet. Doesn't matter if it don't come back. From the of my skin. Well, I'm very pleased to say that we've managed to track down Jess Hull on the other side of the world, newly minted Australian record holder to go with her new Australian 5,000 metre championship. Jess, congratulations. It's um, been a whirlwind few days, but you must be pretty happy with life at the moment. Thank you. Yeah, it's been crazy. It's been quite overwhelming. Like every time I I sort of get back to some Wi-Fi, the phone is just kind of going crazy, which is, it's so, like, that's so, like, lovely to me is that everyone has sent their congratulations and everything and their support and they want to know what's next. So it's exciting to have so many people coming along with me, even though I'm over here with just my team and my coach and my um, physio. So it's nice to have everyone here with me, even when they're not. And um, got to celebrate a little bit on Sunday, Saturday. What day is it? Today is Monday. Yes, yeah, Saturday. Um, my team and I, because we got to stay in Monaco a few extra days, we got to take a little boat trip around and see the coast. So that was nice to kind of reset the mind and the body. And um, that was like, I mean, I was like, kind of like, oh, I want to keep going now because I'm getting ready for some 1500s. But um, when I look back, I think most of my training through COVID was aimed at this race in particular and um coach was really big about me taking the day afterwards to just reset and like use the en- adrenaline that we and the momentum we got from it but really reset and enjoy the moment so got to celebrate with the, the people who know how much work goes into it every day <laughs> well there's a lot worse places to relax than on a yacht in monaco so it's uh, probably <laughs> one of the better ways to spend time i had to settle for swimming in the beach i didn't get a yacht when i was over there but you know, that, that probably says more about me than it does about you. So anyway, before we get to the playground of the rich and famous, why don't we just take a step back? So a little bit earlier this year, before the world got turned on its head, you were down in Melbourne running the Australian title. I think that was actually your first proper 5,000 metre race, if I remember correctly. Is it that right? was my first championship 5K, yeah. I'd run like a, I guess what well, was still a time trial kind of effort in 
September 2019, 1st of September. Um, but yeah, that was my first championship 5K. So it was definitely different going in knowing that it was more important to try and take the win than it was to try and run fast. Um, so I think my efforts in the 5K prior to Friday night had been kind of um, less intense <laughs> in a way, like different focus points to just redlining, um, more focusing on competing. Um, so yeah, that was the first championship one I'd run. Well, I think um, going into that race, we, uh, many of us have talked about how deep that field was in Melbourne and you yeah. obviously just missed that 15-minute barrier but won your first Open Australian title in uh, yeah. 5,000 metres and um, I think obviously qualified automatically for what was then a scheduled Tokyo Olympics yeah. at the time. Um, and, you know, you must have been thinking that this sort of longer stuff is, is something you might be okay at, albeit the, <laughs> I think the focus was still the 15. Uh, I think if you ask me, I would still say the 15. Um, but I know Pete's um, process behind it all was I am very underdeveloped strength-wise. Um, and to really set the foundation for a strong 1500 future, I had to get better at the longer stuff. And um, we sort of used that first year out of college to bridge that, like, m compared to what I can do now, the workouts and the racing um, from the longer distance standpoint were not very good. Um, so to, we really knew that we could strengthen that area pretty strongly. So we've focused on that a lot since I joined Pete, but um, I think at heart, I'm definitely still a 1500 meter runner. <laughs> well, I think, I think if this is you underdeveloped at the 5k, that's pretty scary for everyone else. So, um, <laughs> but so you, you win, you you made a national championship uh, at the 5,000 meters and, um, all plans are, are set to go to the international season. We'll obviously run nationals in Australia first and then yeah. go to the international season and, and try to hit that 1,500-metre qualifier. And then, of course, the world got turned on its head. You were back in the United yeah. States getting your home away from home now and um, the, the world changed. Yeah, it did. It, and it changed really quick at, um, once it got to that point. So I think when I came home for the 5K, I was kind of like, didn't even really realize how um, much of an impact COVID was having at any point in the at any place in the world, and that was the first week of February. And then within about two or three weeks after getting back to the US, it was like, well, this is really serious. And the masks started popping up more frequently, and people were quite nervous on flights and stuff like that. And um, yeah, then March kind of came, and it was just like, how is this year is not going to look like we all thought it was going to. So you, end up, <laughs> so you end up back on a plane uh, back to Sydney, your home down Wollongong Way, um, south of Sydney for those not from New South Wales. And um, that, that was in the glory days where you didn't have to hotel quarantine. You, you had to self-isolate at home. But just talk us through your experience with, you know, COVID, in particular that, that first couple of weeks of, um, you know, having to, to self-isolate at home and then, training you know obviously you'd normally been in the, in the US with your you know quite extensive professional team and now you're back running around yeah. the home cross-country course at Campbell Joggers. <laughs> yeah I mean um, it was I definitely am very grateful that I was at home during all of the lockdowns um, I think I was surrounded by my family and my fiance now um, so to actually be in the same place as them when everyone had to kind of just be keeping to themselves was much better for probably for me mentally. Um, so I was lucky that I was able to come home. Uh, but yeah, it was kind of uh, when they cancelled nationals, I went on my break and I was still in the US at that point. So I wasn't going to come home. Um, and then it started to get a bit scary of like Scott Morrison sort of saying, if you're an Australian and you want to come home, come home now. So I did decide to come home but uh by that point I'd already taken about 10 days off running as my reset kind of thing leading into then the next build up to Tokyo what we thought was coming um so by the time I got home I'd had a break and then I was restricted to two weeks of isolating at home so I just started to get the miles back in on the treadmill which was not <laughs> super fun and I think um my mom and Daniel who were at home with me during the isolation because mom could work from home and we kind of just that was it like we didn't leave the house dad 
um, kept working, so he wasn't able to stay with us, but he would bring us all the supplies. And um, I think that was very testing for both of them because I was definitely not the best version of myself punching out a long run or eight by 800 on the treadmill because it was just torturous. It would get so hot and just like mind numbingly boring, but I got it done and um, I definitely appreciated getting back outside after my two weeks and kind of hit the ground running. Once I got out of self-isolation, I got the mileage back up to normal and I had about, I think I looked at it and I counted back. I had 17 weeks of just like totally consistent training where I ran the same number of miles every week. I hit the two workouts really strong. My long runs were like really strong. So um, I knew that the work was there. And I think the whole way through, I just kept the momentum going in that like, I am 23. If I have 12 extra months to get ready for the Olympics, I'm going to make those 12 months count because when I'm there, well, as long as we're there next year, I, I have some big goals. So I knew that whatever I was doing was not wasted, but um, it was definitely a few times there where you just, it's been a, a big learning curve. Like you kind of just roll with the punches and you learn that not every day has to be perfect, but um, I actually really enjoyed stacking the training weeks together and kind of embracing the grind instead of like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired and I'm racing next week. Like I need to recover. Um, I kind of embrace the mentality of like, if I'm tired in a workout and I can't hit the splits, that's okay. Like if I, as long as it's not happening every single workout. Um, but yeah, I kind of just put my head down and I worked really hard and um, I went into quite a few workouts, very tired, but um, it takes you to a new level. Like you learn how to self-talk your way through them and figure out how to just keep them turning when they hurt <laughs> and um, practice all those good things that we need to be able to do when we're on the start line. So there's a good way to kind of like reset and train with a different intention than it was to kind of be like preparing for something specific for a while there. One of the questions a lot of us who follow the sport and distance running particular have been asking is what effect this would have, uh, this period would have in terms of people doing much longer bases and really having the time to put a base together where, you know, particularly for the Southern Hemisphere athletes of our nationals in, you know, March, April, and then straight into the yeah. European season for an August global title. Um, yeah. Oftentimes you don't get that chance to build a long base. Yeah. And it seems like it's born fruit for you. Yeah, that's it. And um, early on during it all, Pete and I sort of talked and we come up with the plan of like, really, since I joined him in June last year, I hadn't really focused on getting um, fitter in a sense. We'd focused on getting faster and trying to race better. Um, so we just kind of used April, May to just really build the base and get stronger and start punching out the, like actually having to do a five mile tempo and stuff like that, which has been on the program a few times but had always cautiously been reverted back to a four mile tempo right beforehand. So um, being told that, yep, five miles and go five miles. <laughs> um, <laughs> we had an opportunity to do those kinds of things. And um, I think Pete sort of told me, I think it was exactly nine weeks before Monaco that I had a place on the start line as long as the meet was going to go ahead and I could travel. Um, so that allowed us to put together a lot more specific work from that point in time. So I had the base work in at that point. And then once you have that like elusive end goal, uh, that those next nine weeks got super specific and the workouts all started to mean more because I was getting ready to, to come over here and race this 5K. Yeah, well, let's talk about the tune up because I think the, the main sort of uh, hit out before that was a 3K um, at the yeah. crest on the home track at Bankstown. And um, you joined in that as the Steigen uh, World 3K Challenge with Lauren Reed and Chloe Ty and Young Sarah Baker um, yeah. from UTS. So just the four of you on the line. And, um, you know, the cold with bread mantra of it never rains at the crest <laughs> was put to the test. <laughs> um, it, it was a cyclone. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, you managed to run 8.41 uh, in what was just horrendous conditions, albeit with male paces. But... I think yeah. that gave us all a bit of a sign of what you might be able to do in, in this season. Yeah, I think um, at the end of the day, that 3K was just so long in the making. Like I was, to get an actual racing opportunity was, I. it didn't matter if it was 
like snowing or sleeting that night, I was going to run fast because I was just like, <laughs> I've been waiting for this and I've got to get out there and make the most of it because I knew whatever I did that night was going to set me up for um, what was coming on Friday. I knew the 5K, the 3K split within this 5K was going to be insane. So I had to do something that was going to prepare me for that. And yeah, it was just a, I would say more of a mental step forward that 3K was because it was like, I didn't care about the rain. I didn't think about the rain. I was just like, I can run 69s, 70s until I can't. And I want to see how far I can go at that pace. So it was a good, good little hit out and a good little tune up and reminded me of the, the feel of racing when I tried to go to some gears in the last 600 and I didn't quite have them um, that night. But I think it was, I was all the more better and ready for a Friday night because I was able to do that and have the help of you guys to put that on and Jesse and Luke to pace me. That was just, um, it just shows that it's not just me out there on Friday night, like so many other people went into it with me. So it's very, that, very, very lucky. <laughs> James Constance would be pleased to know that with the pacing duties of the yeah. track sessions, he's been That's claiming serious. credit for it all weekend. So. Yeah. Like James, um, Quentin, uh, Will Austin Cray, Alex Seal, Liam Henderson, or Scotty Hamilton, he crushed a few with me down in Wollongong. Like, it's not just me when I stand out there. I'm like, these guys are giving up all their time. I've got to go and show them it was worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you leave Australia in a pretty positive frame of mind from a racing perspective, but you also uh, get engaged to your longtime yeah. partner, Daniel. So I imagine you left, uh, left on a high. Yeah, I did. I didn't see that one coming. Um, my dad did because he told my dad he was going to do it, so he, he couldn't back out. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I think, um, I guess, considering we've been spent a long time apart over the years with me being at school and him being back in Australia was uh, the six months kind of thing with quarantining. He didn't change his mind. So <laughs> 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 well, if you, if you managed to tolerate your, your mileage on the treadmill every week, which is a bit longer yeah, than the rest of ours, you know, it probably um, bodes well. <laughs> Even that's so much, yeah, and he, all those miles on the bike with me and kind of learning how to pace me on the track. I, I even gave the reins to him a few times. I hadn't done that yet, but uh, 400 repeats and he would take the wind for me and I started to trust it. So <laughs> for so long, I've been like, no, I don't trust your pacing. But um, <laughs> no, nah, it was good. It's been fun to kind of incorporate him more into the daily training stuff because he doesn't get to see that all the time either. So yeah, very, very happy. <laughs> Makes your team in a few senses of the word. So you, yeah. you get over to you get over to Europe. Um, you know th things are, are looking well. I don't. I think it was relatively um, non hyped for want of a better term. I mean, we, we obviously knew that a few of you were going over to race Monaco, but yeah. um, I, I don't think anyone really had a great degree of expectation. I um, I very deliberately didn't talk to you, though. I did talk to your dad about it, and your dad was uh, was quite confident that. The Australian yeah. record was on the cards, but I thought I might just keep that to myself. <laughs> um, did, what were your expectations going into the race? What did you think you could do? Yeah, well, so I obviously had 1447.6 on my mind <laughs> um, and probably not to my advantage on my mind during the race as well. Um, and I had spoken to Pete about it and my training partner, Shannon, who was also going to be in the race and, both of us had run, Shannon had run an 8.43k uh, about a week before I did the Steigen 3k. So we, and if actually since we've all kind of been in the same place and we've been able to chat more so about our training, Shannon and I's training has been identical from two different hemispheres. So that was kind of encouraging to know that like we were both in the same shape and we were both ready to roll. And um, both of us had kind of known that we could probably handle 70s for as long as it was as for a long time and hopefully maybe potentially we could handle 70s the whole way which if you break that down 70.0 the whole way is 14.35 so I knew I had some wiggle room <laughs> I think 71s perfectly was um, going to be the Australian record and I'd sort of I talked about it with Pete and he knew that that was what I wanted to do but he also was quick to remind me of like I haven't broken 15 minutes before and you can't skip the 1450s and you can't skip the 1440s, <laughs> the 1440s and just, as well so he was really like smart about it with me and he just sort of um 
once we talked numbers earlier in the week, we didn't talk about them again. And when he gave me my race plan on um, Thursday evening, he said, we didn't come this far to just come over here and just make up the numbers. Like, I just want you to run as hard as you can for 5,000 metres tomorrow to the point that if it's 5,001 metres, you are on the ground, blacked out, done, which I was after 5,000 <laughs> metres. So. <laughs> I imagine for uh, a 1,500 metre runner, that's most 5Ks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I knew the record was possibly on the horizon and I, the people close to me knew that I really wanted to have an attack at it, but I didn't want to put that out there into the public knowledge considering like I haven't done anything that um, is anywhere near it before. So I knew it was going to be uncharted territory and Benita holds it and she is incredible and has so many accolades to her name that like I knew it wasn't going to be easy in a walk in a park and just because I think I can run 70s all day I will be able to like I knew that I had to respect the fact that that was going to be incredibly difficult and just go out there and sort of see what I could do and if I blew up with the K to go I had nothing to lose so yeah it was just a, a matter of that could happen and I'm going to do everything I can to try and make it happen but if it doesn't um there'll be plenty more opportunities in the future. We'll come to Benita shortly, but let's talk about the race itself. So it, it got strung out very early on that the pace was on from the outset. Um, the world champion at 1,500 metres and 10,000 metres, one of your teammates, Van Hassan, uh, actually pulled out of the race. And, of course, Helen Beery, the world champion, went on to win it. Um, yeah. But talk us through the race itself. You obviously weren't up with, um, you know, Abiri and Hassan, but it, it just sort of you were in that nice little pocket and did a lot of the work with Shannon, your, your teammate. Yeah. So just to talk us through the, the tactics of the race itself and how it played out for you. Yeah, I think um, we stayed kind of basically connected through 3,000 metres. And um, Pete had told me that we, so initially in the week, they were going to go for the world record. And then they were like, no, 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 we're going to drop the pace back to 70s. And then they were like settled on the pacemakers were going to go 69s. And Pete sort of just said, he said, we got nothing to lose here. Like if you go out and cop a few 69s early, like that's okay. Let's just like, don't get stressed and just relax. And um, I knew I should not see any splits because I knew as soon as I saw the clock, I was going to be like, oh my gosh, I, how am I going to run another eight laps or whatever it is at this pace. And um, I did see the mile split and it was 4.37. And I do, for me, that was, um, lead pack probably was about 34.35. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, wow, that actually felt, feels pretty good for 4.37. Um, and then I told myself from there, I was like, because I had broken the race down into get through eight laps and then get through two laps and then just try and finish. Um, so I knew from there, I was like, I told myself, I was like, okay, for the next four and a half laps, you do not get dropped. And I just hung on to the back of um, Eilish McColgan was leading Shannon and I at that point, and um, Beatrice Chipkowicz, the steeple chaser, was also with us. And we went through 3K at about 8.45, and I was like, okay, here we go, like 2K to go. And I actually felt really good. And I was like, I know it's coming. The monkey's going to jump on. Just where is it? <laughs> and um, <laughs> we kind of came around. And the beauty, like, obviously you want everything to be that perfect Monaco and magic with the whole, you get the full crowd and the full atmosphere. But with the limited crowd this year, one of the good things about that was I could hear Pete the whole time. So he was standing on the 1500 meter start line um, and he sort of waved Shannon after 3K, so 3100 in, he sort of said, let's go by, let's go by, because it was starting to flow in front of us. And um, so Shannon took it on from there and I knew I just had to commit to what she was doing and just stay connected to her. Um, and then we come around with a mile to go and we've come up to the 1500 meter line and I was like, okay, this is where I I knew how to run a 1500, like I can do this. And then Pete calls out from the sideline, just take a lap. <laughs> and I was like, because it was just Shannon and I left in our little um, pack. Yeah, I, I actually back. read a yep. post from um, from Pete who, who put something up on social media uh, the weekend. Yeah. And said he, he was very proud of the fact that you'd, um, you were prepared to take the race on at that point when he called for you to go around Shannon and, and take up the running. 
Yeah, well, I didn't know at that point. I think as soon as I heard him say that, I just felt like, oh, my God, this got so hard immediately. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I did it. I was like, okay, I'll just, in my head, I was just like, even if you take 200 meters, if you're slowing down, like it's going to help Shannon a little bit and she'll just go around if you can't do it. Um, so, yeah, I went around and I took, I think, about eight to nine hundred meters and then with 600 to go Shannon went back by me again and I've never been so thankful <laughs> for some help in my life because I knew I seen the split with a K to go and I was like okay I need to run about a 302 to be under the Australian record and I actually thought to myself I don't know if I can do that <laughs> because that's like that's like 72's pace and I was like I'm probably going to start running 80s here like I don't know what's going to happen and um, thank goodness for Shannon with 600 to go, she went back around and I was just like, okay, just stick right here. Like, um, or just stick right here for another 400. And if your last 200 isn't good, that's okay. And um, obviously once you hit the bell and you hear that bell, you're like, okay, I can do anything for another 70 seconds and um, was able to come around. And then with 150 to go, you could see the clock on the um, top of the straight there. And it was stopped at, it had just stopped at Helen's winning time and I was like 14.22 and I just thought to myself, got to go because I <laughs> couldn't calculate in my head in that moment what that meant I needed to run. I was just like sprint <laughs> and um, opened it up down the home straight and then I was pleasant. I didn't think it was going to be 14.43. I thought it was going to be a lot tighter than that. Um, but when I crossed the line and I seen 14.43, I was very, very, very stoked and then once you get that initial elation, you start to be like, oh my God, that hurts so bad. I don't think I've ever laid on the track after a race like that before. And um, next thing I knew, Genevieve was right there. And I was just like, wow, I've probably been laying here for about two minutes, but I guess I can get back up now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, we saw, you see you on the broadcast just as you come across the line in sort of the back of shot of, um, of Helen's shot. And yeah. I, I think there was a bit of a, a wave or a, a fist pump yeah. that one so you clearly knew that you, you'd managed to get under Bernardo's time yeah well right before the finish because you know how when the winner crosses they stop the clock and pretty much right before the finish line they it ticked again and I seen it and I was just like I'm gonna do it so um, that was really cool and that was like the first thing before Shannon and I both split ways and just collapsed <laughs> we both said, the first thing she said to me was you did it and then we were both like I think if you can the, the replay I seen was in um French so I'm not sure if it's the same stream that you guys seen um but you see it on the on the, in the background again you see us both like be like good job and she's like you did it and then both of us just flop to the side <laughs> and then um yeah Jen came up to me and said, like, make sure you enjoy this. So, yeah, it was cool to have, like, people that knew what it meant to break an Australian record in the same race as me and able to, like, kind of take that moment with me. So, yeah, I mean, I've been interviewing you after races since I think the first one was probably uh, your national junior 1500-metre title when you are about 18 or 19. And yeah. I've never heard you once in the, you know, however many years it's been since then talk about being in pain in a race and every quote I've read from you in text messages yeah. and, and quotes in um, articles and things has talked about how much that hurt. It, oh, there was nothing like it. I have not experienced that before. With three laps to go, I actually did not think I was going to be able to finish. I was like, I've gone out way too hard. I'm way over my head. But um, in a way, I think the best thing that happened in that last mile was Pete telling me to take a few laps for Shannon was because it just reset the mentality away from the pain. It was like, I don't need to think about how I feel right now because I knew how fast, I know how fit Shannon is and I knew how fast she was trying to run. Um, and it kind of just gave me a task to do in that those like two to three laps to go was a matter of like, okay, I hurt so bad right now, but I want Shannon to run as fast as she's capable of right now. And if that means I need to just suck it up and keep going, um, I can do that. <laughs> but it definitely, it was a pain like I have not experienced. It's just like a slow, it comes on so slowly. Like you feel good, you feel good. And then it's like an instantaneous, you don't feel good. It's not a the case of it over the next lap or so starts to feel really hard. It was just like from zero to a hundred. <laughs> The, so let's talk about the, the results. So 14.43.80 is the new national record. You're fourth in the race behind the world champion, 
reigning world champion. Um, that's your equal best performance in a Diamond League after London last year. Anyone who follows Australian athletics will know Tarby stats from David Tarbutton. And so, as he often says, here are your superlatives. So, 1443.80, Australian record by 3.8 seconds over Benita Willis, uh, set 18 years ago in 2002. Fastest outdoor time by an Oceania athlete, the New South Wales record, a 16 and a half second personal best would have been 13th on the all, on the world list for 2019 and the first Australian women's national record in a distance event above 3,000 metres for 14 years. And most importantly, the Bankstown Athletics Club and Club record. So the... <laughs> Yes. And I mean, when you go back and you think about, you know, all joking aside, that national record and Benita Willis and the career she's had, of course, the world cross country champion, it's such a trailblazer for Aussie distance running and particularly Aussie women distance running. Um, Have you had a chance, it's been a few days now, to have that sink in of what that really means for you and and keeping in mind that the 5K isn't really your event yet? Yeah. I think, honestly, it was this morning on my run. I ran, I had 10Ks this morning and I just was running along and I was thinking about what it all meant. And that was like, it just feels like a pinch me moment. It's just crazy. I didn't think I would be there. I ran the 5K twice in college, like really competitive, like competitively. And I hated it. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I don't know why, but it's just um, something about it in the last 12 months has really grown on me in terms of, I've embraced the workouts and I've embraced the races. And I think that was honestly sparked by the 5k that I ran in Berlin last September. And that's the same place that Benita had broken the record in 2002. And um, to run a 5,000 in that stadium, it just felt really historical. And it was like a a great place to kind of have a really positive experience. And, um, but that, at that time, it was just totally like an unknown to me. So I just, I just ran. And then, um, it kind of ignited the hunger of like, okay, Benita and Eloise have both ran incredibly fast 5Ks and I, I want to be a part of that and like look at the careers that they've had and their, their grit and their like longevity that they had and their range. It just started to sort of show me of like, I don't need to just be in the box of a 1500 meter runner is like I can have the range that those women had and um, still have. They both still run now. So it's like they still have incredible range but um it kind of just opened my eyes to the fact that we don't need to be solely focused on one event we can be good at all of them if we're willing to do the work with them and um i think benita having she has the Australian record from 3000 through to the marathon and that's like she's kind of showing that like it is possible through over time in the course of your career to kind of have a, a good crack at everything and i think she set the way for that and that's definitely um something i'd like to do over time it might take a long time but um over time i'd like to kind of have a go at being good at everything from 1500 up so um we'll see and that's definitely she's shown it's possible and so have people like eloise and sarah jamison have shown us that like you don't just have to be a 1500 meter runner you can be 1500 meter runner through to the marathon if you love the sport and you're willing to stay in it for that long um you can conquer it all <laughs> well let's talk about the marathon because you had <laughs> it's a special special night in monaco of course i mean and you're no stranger to running at, at famous athletic stadiums around the world of course your, yeah. your university of oregon career had you based at what you know will be one of the last athletes ever to run on the old haywood field yeah. Um, yeah. and hopefully one of the first ones to run on the new haywood field but I um Saturday, uh, I keep forgetting that Friday night in Monaco, your time, Saturday, very yeah. early Saturday morning here for us. Um, Josh Shep, the guy, also breaks the the five k men's world record, runs uh, twelve thirty five, and you end up um, having some pretty handy running mates the next morning as well. It must have been a pretty whirlwind twenty four hours. Yeah, it was pretty crazy, and then even um, even in drug testing, I was in drug testing with. Um, Tim Fichariot, Josh Teptegai, Laura Muir. It's like, where on earth does this happen? Like in the same room as these caliber of athletes and um, even just like the pre-meet and stuff as, as the week has gone by and everyone starts to arrive and you start seeing like Faith Kip going in the dining hall and stuff like that. It's just the people that you're around and um, it's kind of a, 
you have to remind yourself that you belong there too. And I think that was um, in my dad's good luck message. He sort of said that there's like, you belong out there with them and make sure you make sure you know that kind of thing. So uh, it's pretty incredible to race against people and be in the same place as people of that caliber. And then even just to race in that stadium was like, I remember watching, well, I don't think I watched it live because I remember it being the drive to a state cross country meet held at Eastern Creek um, when Ryan Gregson broke the Australian record 10 years ago in Monaco. And um, then I would have watched it, I'm assuming I watched a replay probably that evening and being like, wow, that place looks incredible to run because of just like the, the arches and the architecture and the crowd and the track itself. And um, I think ever since then I've been like, I cannot wait for my chance to run there and um, getting to have that this year in the middle of the year we're having and kind of when they re-released the program for Monaco when it was going to go ahead, um, there wasn't a women's 1500 or a mile. So I was like, oh damn, I'm going to have to wait another year to get my chance to run in Monaco. And then um, Pete sort of told me I'd been accepted into the 5k and I was like, whoa, well, I'm going to be way out of my out of my league but I get to go to Monaco and I get to race there and experience that setting and I'm going to sort of try and have my own little piece of the Monaco magic and whatever that means this year it's going to mean over 5,000 meters instead of what I thought would be my first experience in a 1500. <laughs> well it's funny how things work out so you, you join Ryan as an Australian to break a national record on the Monaco track but and, yeah. I mean, so you're on a high, you've broken the national record back to the one of the nicer hotels in the world at Monaco um, yeah. and then have a, a pretty handy uh, Saturday morning run or Sunday morning run, I think. Sunday morning long Sunday run. Morning. Yeah, so um, my long run on Sunday was pretty cool. Is uh, Shannon and I both had, uh, we had to get our long run in. Um, and if anyone's been to Monaco, it's not really distance runner friendly um the town itself like it's very a lot of pavement and a lot of just um populated pathways so not the best for a long run but um we were lucky enough that Paula Radcliffe uh, lives in Monaco has her yeah she lives in Monaco and she has a, a holiday house outside of the town and um she knows the trail system pretty well and she'd done one of her build-ups to the New York Marathon the year she won the New York Marathon she'd done her last month of training in Monaco over this um, long run loop that we did. And it was very hilly, <laughs> um, not perfect terrain. Like it just definitely sh perfect for leading into a New York marathon because that's pretty tough course and very um, technical course. So she met us and sort of showed us the ropes of that loop and got to run with her for the first 20 minutes or so of my run and um, just listened to her uh, kind of I just sort of listened to both her and Shannon chatting away and they've got both got children and stuff now. And um, when Shannon first met Paula, her daughter was the same age as what Shannon's daughter is now. So that's kind of crazy because her daughter is 13 now. So they've, they've known each other for a while. But um, it was just kind of, it was very cool to listen to Paula's insights of the, the meet itself in general and how she thought people had raced and what she thought about chapter guy and things like that. It was just really 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 cool to be a kind of a fly on the wall of those conversations and um pretty lucky to have someone like her be able to show us around and <laughs> make sure we got a good quality long run in so couldn't ask for more <laughs> she inspired you to step up to the marathon no not just yet uh definitely not just yet <laughs> i think it's okay, it's a bit far. Um, he dadded bike with me for one of my long runs a few weeks ago before I left home and it was a 15 miler and I said to him immediately after that like I'd had a, a solid run and I really enjoyed the run and I just said to him I said I cannot imagine running for like an, another 50 55 minutes like that just it just doesn't appeal to me just yet but I love the sport so much that I want to like I will explore it eventually when I run out of track speed. <laughs> So you have a travel day yesterday and you've found your way up to Sweden. Uh, yes. Talk about, uh, give, give us an insight into what's coming up next and what's on the horizon. You've obviously, it's still a very strange time around the world, particularly to be traveling internationally. Um, and, yeah. you know, you're obviously going to have to get back here at some point. So um, what, what's the, the plan for the next little while? Yeah, it's just, um, it's definitely different to a normal year where you kind of have your intended races lined up because right now meets are changing 
very quickly, like depending on the social distancing and stuff. Um, there's a meet in France that has a 3000 on it that I would really like to get into, but it looks like that meet's probably not going to go ahead now. And that's only as of yesterday because France reinstated some social distancing rules. Um, so it's a really good time for me to remember to be adaptable and that like it doesn't have to be perfect. So I think um, that's the, the mantra of this, this trip is like, it doesn't matter, like nothing is set in stone. Um, so yeah, right now my next race is in Gothenburg, Sweden um, on the 29th of August and that will be a 1500. Um, and then I know I will run another 1500 in Berlin on September 13th, but everything in between is just gonna be in the moment kind of on the fly whatever looks like a good opportunity that's safe to get to and um isn't going to be over the top of extreme travel or extreme layovers or anything um we'll take those little opportunities but for the focus will be Gothenburg 1500 and berlin 1500 and then from there potentially i might go to the doha diamond league but that depends on um how doha approaches letting people in that meet um that's september 25th and then after that i will return to australia and i will do my hotel quarantine so <laughs> um i i assume i'm going to be returning around the same time as the other six aussie distance runners who are over here so maybe we'll all end up in the same place <laughs> um, but yeah so right now i and i'm trying not to think about the hotel quarantine because things change so quickly so i'm like I know that I'm going to have to do it, but a part of me is hopeful that maybe by the 1st of October, I can isolate at home. I don't like my chances of that, but I, I knew that coming over here was that if I was going to come over and take these opportunities, I was going to have to do my time when I come home. And honestly, doing some travel back and forth and um, even just yesterday traveling to Sweden, there's a lot of people in one place in those airports. And no matter how hard you try, the social distancing is not always easy to adhere to. So I do definitely understand that when I come home, I'll have to quarantine. And I think that that's probably the safest thing for, well, definitely is the safest thing. So I understand it and I'll cop it. <laughs> you might have to get a bit better at um, running on the treadmill again, back to uh, yeah, earlier I this year. So at least you're in <laughs> practice. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, um, if anything, it's more mental training than it is physical. So I, you know, wherever you get the gains from. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about being adaptable, which is obviously so important this year. I mean, I think we're only yeah. a few days uh, out from um, when you and I were both supposed to be in Tokyo, albeit in slightly different yeah. capacities. Um, you were meant to be running the heats of the 1500 and I had a ticket to watch you. Um, yeah. Have you had a, a chance to, I mean, it's been such a whirlwind that, you know, I, I imagine it's a mix of emotions where you were meant to be making an Olympic debut um, you know, probably a, a favourite to make an Olympic final. Um, you don't get the chance to do that. You may not get the chance to do that next year either. Um, but you've you've managed to break an Australian record in Monaco. I, I imagine there's a, a fair <laughs> mix of emotion in all of that. Yeah, definitely. Especially that first week of August when it was like when we should have been in Tokyo. Um, I think I'd done a very good job of just focusing on the training until that point, and then. As, as you sort of see in the media, it's just like we should have been in Tokyo this week, and it's really hard to actually fathom how that how this 2020 would have gone on a normal sequence. Like it's weird to kind of think that like I would have raced at Prefontaine and things like that would have happened. Um, it's just it doesn't seem it seems so far from what we have. So it's just like it doesn't it's hard to picture what that perfect year would have looked like if it was how it was supposed to go. Um, definitely, yeah, the thought that we may not get an Olympics next year, that is pretty heartbreaking because I don't know, it's like when you look at going back to like Benita and Eloise and uh, those women and the careers they've had, they're three and four time Olympians. And I'm young enough that like, I, I would hope that I could potentially be a three, four time Olympian that the thought of maybe one of them just getting taken away from me is is pretty heartbreaking but um for right now it's still there so don't don't waste the energy thinking about that until it's actually a factor if it does become a factor um but yeah kind of just the the 15 the australian record in the 5k was like the motivator for the base training and the stuff that i've done while i was training at home and i think um 
I had hoped that I was going to get an opportunity to have a go at it. So it kind of definitely was the light at the end of the tunnel um, as an attempt, but uh, it's still a, a big privilege to have been able to come over here and actually action that in place. So yeah, it's it's been the, the motivator, but um, to be able to actually do it when we didn't know what the year was going to look like is it's a bit of as it was a big win in a year that just kept like felt like it was a, a few hits in a row there. <laughs> well, speaking for everyone out here, it's um it's been a welcome pick me up for all of us watching you run, and yeah, you know, a lot of us have watched you from your early to mid teenage years running, and yeah. um you know I think we're all very very proud of you and the Australian distance running community have given us something to smile about. So I, I think this is your first interview um, since uh, breaking the, the record of, of, of substance. So I think everyone will be really pleased to um, hear you reflect on the race and, and what it's meant to you. So um, we'll, we'll let you get back to whatever it is you need to be doing on a on what it is a Monday in uh, in Sweden. But thanks so much for, for taking the time to have a chat to us and, um, you know, from a from a very grateful Aussie distance running community. Thanks for, you know, taking the time to chat to us. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks for taking the time that gets the Bankstown Sport, Bankstown track <laughs> project out on the world stage. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jess. We're going to see you soon. Thanks, Matt. <laughs>